joining us, and it's a full house. Really, really appreciate. Sorry for being so cramped. We, we did want to get a bigger, bigger room, but because of so many events, this was the only, only available one. Um, I recall that back in 2015, we had the very first discussion uh, where, together with Unicree, uh, we were talking about uh, CBRN, a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threat uh, mitigation, and that was the time when artificial intelligence came up somehow. We had few other events with wonderful presentations for the companies who were involved in, uh, in, in artificial intelligence, and after that, a lot of things have done, passed, and here we are having this uh, special uh, event together with my co-organizers and great friends, uh, United Arab Emirates and Ambassador Tanazaki Nuseibe, and uh, the Netherlands, who was always with us, uh, the DPR, Liz, uh, and um, the Netherlands also is uh, the host country to the Center for Artificial Intelligence, uh, a small unit under the Unicri, and thank you, thank you very much uh, for hosting this. So time is of essence, uh, let's get started. And I would like to ask everyone to limit their presentations uh, or uh, interventions four minutes, four to five uh, minutes, so that we have ample time for Q&As and also for very interesting presentations that, that follow. So with no further ado, let me uh, pass the floor to my colleague, Lana Zaki Nuseibe, uh, permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates. Floor is yours, Lana. Thank you, Ambassador Kahan. Great to see so many interested faces in this very, very important topic, uh, the nexus of technology and security is something that we are all engaging in more frequently here in New York. Uh, and I'd also like to add my thanks uh, to our co-organizers, so Georgia, the Netherlands, the UN Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute, and Interpol for co-sponsoring uh, this event. Discussions about the use of artificial intelligence and robotics at the UN tend to be pessimistic. We often talk about the risks of AI as if the world were turning into George Orwell's 1984. Robotics tends to get the same treatment. Although some of these risks are real, AI as such, in many countries' views, is neither good nor bad. It's how it's applied uh, that needs regulation. In the right hands, AI and robotics have enormous potential for advancing positive social developments. But these will not happen on their own. Some form of regulation will, uh, in my view, uh, be necessary in the future, which is a fact that even Mark Zuckerberg acknowledged in his op-ed in the Washington Post this last weekend, uh, if those of you who've, who've read it. It was quite a fascinating uh, turnaround in the space of the companies in the last two years on this issue. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's incumbent upon governments and the international community to create and think about what the rules-based order is, what it looks like uh, around the subject of technologies so that all people have a chance to benefit and also to prevent their abuse. The UAE's definitely recognized this. Um, we've committed to a future where AI is very much an integral part of our society and development, which is why we've named our first Minister of State for AI. Who's, impl who's implementing and responsible for implementing AI strategy across our government uh, sector. And we think this will not only make us more efficient, but also more able to build the skills necessary for the digital economy of the future, data science, coding, computer engineering, et cetera. But we're also all here working at the United Nations to support the frameworks about thinking about the digital space in a coherent way. Uh, the Secretary General recently launched a high-level panel on digital cooperation that we're very supportive of as an initiative. And in fact, we have a member on that panel, which is led by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma. And I think they're doing uh, some important work in the report that they're writing for the consideration of UN member states and civil society here in New York. And obviously, the push towards AI has already had a significant effect on uh, law enforcement and uh, how we think about security in the UAE and around our region. We're obviously keen to employ the latest technologies to keep our citizens safe. But at the same time, this big question of the privacy of the rights of individuals is one that we have to all collectively think about as we enter into this new era. 
and in a uh, world where cyber attacks are likely going to be the initial prime mover of any new conflict, um, it's clear that there is also work for diplomats in this space. Today's event will showcase the benefits of new crime fighting tools and techniques that use AI, such as facial recognition software to identify criminal suspects, which is already being used in the UAE, or the advanced analytics that allow police resources to be more efficiently allocated to high crime areas. I'll conclude by saying that events like this are really critically important because AI and related technologies are still, despite massive progress, still in their infancy. We have a lot of uh, mileage to go before we learn about the best ways to use them in a law enforcement context, but also we have a lot of mileage to go in terms of thinking in a way that is responsive to the environment that is changing very rapidly about how that technology is used ethically, responsibly, and in a way that respects international law. Uh, the system that we all find protects all of our rights. So we're here to uh, partner with any of the governments or agencies who have best practices to share in this regard, and we look forward to hearing a very lively and active discussion on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana. And let me turn to my other friend and uh, co-organizer, Ambassador Lisa Gregoire, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands. Lisa. Thank, thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you all for being here in such great numbers. And I, I think it shows uh, the interest that member states of the United Nations put into this topic. And I, I even dare to say that it also shows that the UN is almost ready for this topic. So um, I also like to thank my co-host of the United Arab Emirates and, and Georgia. Uh, thanks to Interpol and Unicri for organizing this event and, and also for putting this important topic on the agenda. Um, and we, I'm also happy to see such distinguished panelists uh, and speakers that we will, are looking forward to hear later on. Uh, and it's also very important from our perspective to see that these panelists and speakers have a big variety of backgrounds and, uh, and standpoints. And I think that for this discussion, it's very important that we hear as many different perspectives as we possibly can to come to something that is actually uh, worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this meeting w w for us, and, and Kaha already said uh, that it has many origins. For us, it's very important also as a follow-up uh, to the Interpol initiative and first conference in Singapore that was funded by the Netherlands. Uh, and I hope that our meeting today was, will give us more insight into the risks and the benefits of artificial intelligence in, um, from a crime, uh, terrorism, and security perspective. Transnational organized crime and terrorism are major security concerns uh, for the world community. And those concerns become even more complex with the misuse of artificial intelligence by criminals and terrorists. Uh, and the necessity to discuss those in a, in a format like this one becomes even more, uh, more uh, important than ever. Like was, was, what was said before, artificial intelligence has many potential benefits uh, for our law enforcement agencies, uh, and our law enforcement, enforcement agencies have good experiences with public-private cooperation in this area, and that is one of the topics that we're really looking forward to discuss uh, today. And in the Netherlands, the National Police Lab Artificial Intelligence, together with the University of Amsterdam and Utrecht, is exploring these benefits. For example, chatbots, uh, which are having conversations with citizens or simulation techniques to investigate the development of criminal networks. And the Royal Netherlands Marechaussee is researching technology that combines information obtained by camera surveillance with information from other sensors in order to retrieve useful information for apprehending suspects. So science fiction movies are becoming reality uh, nowadays. But besides the benefits, and also that has been mentioned before, we also have to think about the legal and the ethical side of artificial intelligence. So let me briefly touch upon this in the opening report. Uh, ethics by design, in our view, is key. We have to think about ethical consequences of artificial intelligence in advance, not just when the system has been implemented. 
accountability, responsibility, and transparency are the principles that should guide our thinking and work in the area of artificial uh, intelligence and security. And in that context, the European Commission is working on ethics guidelines for trust trustworthy artificial intelligence to ensure that artificial intelligence is a human-centric and relies on fundamental rights, ethical principles, and shared values. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion uh, that takes both the benefits and the legal and ethical aspects of artificial intelligence into account, a challenge that all experts around the table can most probably easily address and say a lot more interesting things about than I can. So I'm really looking forward to, to hear from the speakers uh, and hear from the panelists uh, so that we all learn from this uh, meeting and take it forward and, and see how we can make it into a very useful follow-up. So I'm very much looking forward. Thank you, Kaham. Floor is back to you. Thank you very much, Liz. Indeed, artificial intelligence, like other things in life, comes with good and bad risks and benefits. And today's meeting is just to explore simply one part of it, because there won't be any aspect of life that will not be affected, or rather that is not already affected with the exponential technologies and with the artificial intelligence. Let me turn to our co-organizers uh, at this stage who've been with us in uh, organizing this event. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Director of uh, Unicri, uh, Madame Bettina tucci Barciotas. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's great to see so many people interested in this topic in this room. And it's always good when, uh, when we feel the, the human bond that uh, we have in, in, in looking at these uh, challenging but very current topic. I would like to, of course, thank all our permanent missions, Georgia, the Netherlands, United Arab Emirates, for bringing us together, as well as our great partnership with Interpol. Um, I would uh, welcome you, of course, on behalf of my institute, the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute, and I'm also very happy that uh, the chairman of our board, Jay Carrier, has joined us today. I am deeply uh, thankful for our co-hosts, their exceptional support in bringing this meeting uh, to happen, and we look forward to the collaboration with them and with all the member states in the future. As has been said, and as we all know, uh, we are riding a huge wave of innovation and technology improvements. Um, advancements in artificial intelligence and robotics are fundamentally altering how we live our lives, whether we realize it or not. Um, uniquely, since 2015, has been bringing this to the attention of the General Assembly. In 2015, together with the Embassy of uh, Mission of Georgia, we convened an earlier discussion on artificial intelligence, and we continue to work organizing training sessions, multi-stakeholder forums for discussion, and encouraging a responsible innovation throughout the public and private sectors. Um, as was mentioned by the distinguished uh, representative from the Netherlands, uh, together with The Hague, which is the city of peace, justice, and innovation, we set up this center for AI and robotics. And the municipality of The Hague and the private sector, One Qubit Information Technologies, have been partnering with us. I believe that that speaks to our um, sustainable agenda, so to the Agenda 2030, and how in this topic we cannot leave anyone out of the conversation, and we need to partner between the UN organizations with uh, member states and also with the private sector as well as with academia. So last July, we joined Interpol and convened uh, the first global meeting to stake, take stock of specific challenges and opportunities. And we are very proud to continue this partnership with Interpol. And you will see on your desks that you have a publication of which I believe we share the pride with Interpol on uh, preparing this report uh, on robotics and AI for law enforcement. We hope this will be a valuable resource to everyone, informative, as well as specific suggestions that are included in the study for police chiefs. So it's an action-oriented document. It's not a theoretical document. It's a document that can be put to use already today. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's important that AI and robotics can be used to enhance national capacities of law enforcement and the criminal justice system and help us to combat crime, counterterrorism, and strengthen security in our communities like never before. Uh, you may remember that our Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, said in a, during the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona this past February, and I quote, digital surveillance combined with artificial intelligence can help law enforcement, but can also be used to violate privacy and persecute dissenting voices. And we already heard from our distinguished um, sponsors how it is important also that we preserve the issue of privacy and, in general, human rights, of course. Um, I wish to underscore that innovation cannot, will not, and is not going to be stopped. It will continue. But as we embark down this road and explore the use of these innovative technologies in law enforcement and security sector, we must ensure that we never lose sight of the rule of law and the comprehensive body of human rights law that has been meticulously developed over decades. The risk of harm is just too great. It will not be easy to translate these laws and principles into code, but I'm confident that if we continue to explore these opportunities and challenges collectively, we will succeed, and our communities will be safer and more secure as a result. Let me conclude, uh, dear guests, to let you know that we, within the United Nations also, we are making sure that we are collaborating on this issue, and I'm very pleased that I will be signing a memorandum of understanding with my dear colleagues from the information and communication technology area, uh, in which we will facilitate our joint exploration of technological innovation for crime prevention and criminal justice. It is an important step to make sure that we take theory and we put it into practice and that the UN is ready for the challenges ahead. Let me close by thanking everybody for being here this afternoon. And um, law enforcement, security agencies, academia, private sector, civil society, we have really representatives from all the sectors. And as I say, I think that this bodes well for um, addressing the challenges of Agenda 2030 and the innovation technology uh, challenges that we have in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Bettina. And let me turn to my neighbor on the floor, Interpol, Carl uh, Alexander, Executive Director for Partnerships and Planning, another co-organizer of this event. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, distinguished guests, um, like everyone who has spoken before me, um, I want to say how impressed I am with the uh, number of people who are uh, in attendance today. Uh, this is very uh, reassuring. and. Um, very happy to uh, to be here to join you. It is certainly my honor to open this high-level meeting entitled Artificial Intelligence in Robotics, Reshaping the Future of Crime, Terrorism, and Security. And as one of the co-hosts, and on behalf of Interpol, Interpol, the only global law enforcement organization connecting 194 member countries for a safer world, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome all of you. I would also like to express my uh, uh, sincere gratitude to the Republic of Georgia, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, the United Arab Emirates, as well as UNICRI uh, for sponsoring and co-organizing uh, this important event with uh, Interpol. Among many definitions of artificial intelligence you will probably hear during the course of this afternoon, I would highlight the following. In every instance, when a machine or a system performs a task that would have otherwise require human intelligence, I would respectfully submit to you that one of the most consequential aspect of the task being performed is to ensure a safe and secure future for our citizens, for our people, and for our society. 
and to ensure this safe and secure future, we need to ask ourselves three main questions. One, how can we prevent criminals and terrorists from exploiting AI and robotics in their activities? Second, how do we, as, a, as members of the international community, balance the benefits and the risk presented by the uh, use of AI and robotics? And third, how could law enforcement minimize these risks and optimize the opportunities offered by these new technologies? The extent of current integration of AI and robotic applications in our daily lives is the best evidence that these three questions are not fictional questions. They are real. These are not issues that can wait to be addressed in a distant future. These questions are for the now. These questions are relevant for our development. These questions are important for our prosperity. And they are important for our safety and security. As with any technological advances of the past, Advancements which were initially designed uh, for the improvement of societies, AI and robotic technologies are indeed susceptible to malicious exploitation. And this dark side of AI and robotics involves three main areas of vulnerabilities. And they are as follows, digital, physical and political, and I will address each one of them very briefly in turn. The first two areas, digital and physical, are of particular concern almost for all critical infrastructures. From power supplies to communications to banking, financial systems, today's as well as tomorrow's critical infrastructures are increasingly interconnected and are either entirely or partially dependent on digitalized operating system and therefore are vulnerable. Regarding the third area of vulnerabilities, one of law enforcement's key challenges moving forward is dealing with the tremendous amount of big data that is out there and available. Big data that is capable of being maliciously manipulated through AI technologies to launch misinformation and deception campaigns, causing a deep negative impact on the fabrics of society and on the political process. As has already been said by previous speakers, the report being formally released today, which is entitled Artificial Intelligence and Robotics for Law Enforcement, is the positive results of a first meeting on this topic last July in Singapore between Interpol and UNICRI. And we're very, very grateful for the relationship and the partnership that we have developed with Unicree, and it's a re partnership and relationship that will certainly continue in the future. Today here in this building at the headquarters of the United Nations, we are continuing pursuing what has started, what started approximately a year ago when we identified artificial intelligence as one of the most impactful technologies for law enforcement. And by being in this landmark building, we together will be elevating the dialogue on the topic to a political level. That's important because to do the work correctly, resources are needed. The political backing of our political leaders are required. Having this dialogue is indeed 
a major first step by the international community to gather the necessary political support as well as expert contributions required to identify, and this begins this afternoon, to identify and share among member countries best practices on how AI and robotics advancements could offer society new opportunities to develop and prosper in a manner consistent with the 2030 agenda for, uh, uh, for sustainable development. And at the same time, and at the same time, support and assist law enforcement on how to safeguard societies from the dark side of the same technology in alignment with Interpol's recently launched global policing goals. This leads me to my third and last question regarding how law enforcement should seize the opportunities offered by AI and robotic technologies to enhance their crime prevention and response capabilities uh, throughout the world. Because if law enforcement does not seize on the opportunities offered by the new technologies, the risk of being outpaced by savvy criminals and terrorists will be very high. It really will. And the results could be quite serious, if not catastrophic. So we all need to pay attention. As strongly highlighted in the report, whatever we do from a law enforcement perspective to capitalize on the opportunities presented, we will need to do so in a manner that is mindful of the ethical dimension of deploying these technologies across the spectrum of crime, prediction, and analysis, and prevention, especially taking into account human rights considerations and citizens' rights to privacy. Very, very important. On all those areas and aspects, international cooperation is going to be key. Like in many other fields, we at Interpol observe that among all 194 member countries, there is a significant disparity in terms of allocated resources, technical capabilities, and level of engagement at the national law enforcement level to explore artificial intelligence and robotics applications. But in light of the current early stages of uh, law enforcement readiness to explore the full potential of this new technology. The publication of this report is very, very timely. The report clearly and specifically recommends several key areas. I'm not going to mention all of them, but I will mention a few that I think are quite important. The report talks about more research into new crimes involving malicious use of AI and robotics. It recommends clear and acceptable legal and ethical framework built upon fairness, accountability, and transparency. It further recommends continuous dialogue to transfer knowledge and experience and open the doors toward further partnerships, including public-private partnerships. And finally, it recommends concrete initiatives to be taken by the chiefs of police, as has mentioned by uh, Unicri. As a neutral global platform connecting law enforcement authorities around the world, Interpol will continue to facilitate multi-stakeholders, dialogue, and collaboration on this topic. Today's event is just a part of an ongoing endeavor on our part. In three months, on the margins of Interpol World 2019, which is an event organized every two years by Interpol and its partners, We'll be bringing together innovative leaders from law enforcement, business, and the academic world, 
and we will be hosting once again in Singapore with Unukri on July 3rd through the 4th, the second global meeting on the opportunities and risk of AI for law enforcement. The Interpol Unukri Global Meeting is one major forum, but it is not the only collaboration venue that is available. Another vehicle is a more threat-oriented uh, forum, which is uh, uh, the Interpol Chaired Working Group on Emerging Threats and Critical Infrastructure, on which many other organizations participate, including UNOCRI. Um, and within that framework, of, it, it is within the framework of the UN Counterterrorism Compact Tax Task Force of the Office of Counterterrorism. Um, Interpol is fully committed to this process, and we are fully commi committed to safeguarding appropriate standards for the use of artificial intelligence by law enforcement. So this afternoon, like many of you, I am also going to be in a listening mode, um, hoping to gain some further insights from all of you and uh, look forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the contribution of Singapore and something, Burhan, you really have to be proud of for the two events, one that you've already hosted and the other one that was just uh, mentioned. Uh, let me move to the special addresses that we have. And there are th three UN branches, three UN hands that are so much involved in this matter. And let us start with um, Office of Counterterrorism. And let me turn to Under Secretary uh, Vladimir Voronkov. Please, floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. First of all, uh, a lot of words of gratitude to the permanent representative of Georgia the United Arab Emirates and the Netherlands for organizing of this event. It's very important to discuss this issue because time is uh, going very fast and new technologies appear about every day and we need to address these new challenges. Of course, it's not very easy to speak after the representatives of the most comprehensive geographical organization. We are still 193. <laughs> but we are trying to catch up. <laughs> the international counterterrorism efforts continue to address a broad range of threats emanating from terrorist groups of all sizes. In many aspects of our life, the internet has leveled the playing field, giving a voice and opportunities to the millions of people who didn't have it before. While largely a force of good, we have unfortunately seen that it's quite often benefits the forces of evil. Today, small terrorist cell and lone wolves have access to many of the same resources that the large terrorist organizations such as ISIL Daesh or Al Qaeda have. Those cells and individuals do not need great financial resources. They misuse the internet to access bob making guidelines. They spread their hateful ideology on social media for propaganda and recruitment purposes. They exchange information on the dark web for their heinous purposes. Terrorists are likely to try to weaponize new and emerging technologies, such as drones, artificial intelligence, and synthetic biology. Reportedly, Daesh successfully used commercial drones for surveillance missions in Syria and armed them with grenades during the battle for Mosul in 2017. To counter such threats, we need to expand our toolbox to include new instruments. Artificial intelligence and robotics in particular are promising technologies that could provide law enforcement with important tools to support their efforts to counter terrorism. Robotic patrol systems could help police in remote border areas and drones have uh, already assisted with 
surveying territories that is difficult to access, but that's often misused by terrorists for safe haven. Big data and artificial intelligence could help to detect or even predict and prevent crimes, including terrorism. Machine, uh, machine learning is already employed to find terrorism-related content on social media. As computer processing power and available data increase, hateful videos such as footage of the recent terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand, will be removed the internet more quickly. When all these technologies are combined and fit into one command and control center, law enforcement will be empowered to react more swiftly in targeted fashion to potential terrorist threats. However, there are three important aspects that we must consider in this context. First, it's important to ensure that all member states have access to and benefit from this new technology. This is crucial. Member states in the global south are most affected by the scourge of terrorism, but do not always have the required means to protect their population from terrorist attacks. I therefore call upon member states and private sector to share their experience, expertise and support developing countries in their efforts to counter terrorism. I would like to offer the support of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism as a convener and enabler in this regard. I have already advised my office to explore initiatives in the area of artificial intelligence and big data to identify avenues to support member states' counterterrorism efforts with the help of these new technologies. And I invite all of you to participate in our efforts. The United Nations Office of Counterterrorism is also jointly organizing with the government of Belarus an international high-level conference on countering terrorism through innovative approaches and uh, use of new and emerging technologies, which will be held in September 2019 in Minsk. The purpose of the conference will be to shed light on the misuse of new technologies for terrorist purposes, but also an opportunities that artificial intelligence provides, especially in the context of border security. <coughs> to better coordinate the capacity building efforts within the United Nations system. We are also in the process of reinvigorating the multi-agency working groups of the Global Counterterrorism Compact Task Force on Emerging Technologies and Critical Infrastructure. And this uh, working group was mentioned in presentation of distinguished representative of Interpol. This will help us collaborate, leverage existing capacities, and reap synergies in our efforts to support member states. Secondly, while the development of new technologies is promising, we must always respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. Some of these technologies may be highly intrusive and infringe upon individuals' rights. We need to keep also close dialogue with civil society organizations in this regard. As the Secretary General Guterres has said, when we protect human rights, we are tackling the root causes of terrorism. Member states have recognized uh, in the United Nations global counterterrorism strategy that effective counterterrorism measures and the protection of human rights are not conflicting goals, but complementary and mutually reinforcing. Advances in automation and robotics also pose a number of ethical questions and moral dilemmas. Should we leave for fighting to machines? Should a robot be enabled to kill a human being based on code? These are questions we need to address and to answer. Thirdly, I am particularly grateful to our colleagues from UNICRI and Interpol for inviting private sector representatives to this very important event. The private sector is in many cases the engine of innovations and owns both the knowledge and the infrastructure of new technologies. 
I would be keen to learn about your views on how we can collaborate to use your inventions to counter terrorism and for the good of humanity. The risk we face leaves us only one way forward. We need to continue innovating and collaborating among all of us, the United Nations, member states, governments, and the private sector. I will invite all of you here today to work hand in hand. The Russian-American science fiction writer Isaac Azimov once famously said, the saddest aspect of life is that science gather, gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. End of quote. I therefore call, for, uh, I therefore call upon you, let's be wise so that we can meet the legal and moral challenges of inventions to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Let me turn to Counter-Terror Executive Director at Michel Konings. Floor is yours, please. Uh, gentlemen, uh, allow me to join uh, Yusuf Vronkov in thanking uh, the permanent representatives of uh, Georgia, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Unicri, and uh, Interpol in uh, convening this very timely and important uh, meeting. Uh, I'm also on a more personal uh, level very happy to meet uh, one of my dear friends uh, who I haven't seen uh, for a very uh, long time here in this meeting, so that means a lot to me. If I would have been uh, a machine robot, uh, Mr. Chair, I would have been able to reduce my speech of eight minutes into four minutes uh, with uh, no uh, problem at all. But I'm a human being. I will do my best. <laughs> the, re <coughs> the recent advances, uh, advances of uh, AI uh, and robotics have been truly impressive indeed, uh, with significant impl implications uh, for different fields like medicines, uh, finance and transportation. The machines have surpassed human abilities uh, in many areas, unthinkable just a few years ago. And for instance, machine learning learning tools powered by AI can help us better understand some behavioral patterns of terrorist and terrorist networks, assist tech platforms, assess online terrorist content and prioritize posts to be removed quickly often before they can uh, get uh, viewed to help law enforcement to identify in incitement to terrorism online and analyze data and detect sources of support for uh, ISIS uh, and so forth. Um, However, many experts also concerned uh, at the potential social and uh, political impact, as already has been alluded to, of AI systems, but also moral and ethical issues that are arising from it. Uh, warning of the potential for data inequality, lack of uh, algorithmic uh, transparency and accountability and behavior market distortion. Member States are thus faced uh, with um, a huge task of understanding the legal, the policy and the ethical considerations of this technology, which the Secretary General has likened to as a new frontier. They must consider not only its potential to improve the quality of life of billions of people, but also the threat to privacy, safety, security and basic human rights. The private sector <coughs> must be included in this dialogue not least because business are, of course, at the forefront of the development and implementation of AI solutions. The Security Council has developed uh, an extensive counterterrorism framework through its adoption of numerous resolutions. And in doing so, it uh, has requested member states to make use of technological advances in their efforts to counter the global threat of terrorism. And the CTC, with the support of CTET, assesses member states' capacities mm -hmm. to implement the relevant resolutions and working together with its many implementing partners facilitates the delivery of technical assistance. CTET also identifies emerging terrorism trends, challenges and effective approaches to address them and assists states both to identify ways to tackle terrorist abuse of new technologies and to make use of those same technologies in their counterterrorism efforts while respecting human rights and the rule of law. And this, of course, includes addressing the use of AI, machine learning and big data. Allow, allow me to briefly describe some of CTAT's work in this area. Through its Tech Against Terrorism initiative, CTAT promotes and facilitates the development of public-private partnerships 
to address the exploitation of ICT by terrorists while respecting human rights. This initiative focuses on supporting startups and mid-market tech companies. CETAD also collaborates with the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism, an industry-led initiative that seeks to reduce access to online terrorist content, including through investment in automated technology, knowledge sharing and capacity building. This uh, forum uh, is employing a database of hashes um, to facilitate the identification and removal of explicit terrorist content from platforms. For example, in the aftermath uh, of the recent terrorist attacks in New Zealand, Google and Facebook's algorithm compared each new shared video to the hash of the original live stream of the attack, blocking everything with even a partial match. Um, as a result, Facebook removed more than 1.2 million of copies at upload. However, thousands of videos slipped through the net uh, with some of the more tech-savvy users taking deliberate steps uh, to circumvent the platform's automated systems. There is no doubt, however, that AI and data analytics are very useful in supporting the related work of analysts and content moderators. However, there is still a lot of work to be done on, IA, on AI. Training data to help um, machine learning model make some um, predictions and the system's ability to make sense of that data. New technologies, including AI, also affect the full range of human rights uh, protected by the international counterterrorism instruments. And one of those rights is the right to privacy. Governments have an important role to play in creating effective mechanisms to remedy the adverse human rights impacts of AI. CETED is also working on a project to identify and collect existing international, regional, uh, regional and national standards and good practices to promote international sharing of data to counter terrorism while guaranteeing respect for the right to be free from arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy and safeguarding protected data in compliance with the international human rights <coughs> instrument. This work will also inform our work in uh, other areas, including our efforts to promote the proper and responsible use of biometrics uh, and databases of suspected terrorism and to promote legal access to digital evidence across borders. It will also contribute to our promotions of the addendum to the guiding principles of foreign fighter terrorists uh, adopted by the CTC in December 2018, which addresses privacy and data protection issues in countering the evolving foreign terrorist fighters threat. In our efforts to understand the impact of new technologies on security, we must adopt a holistic approach that includes the development and strengthening of public-private partnerships, including in our work within the framework of the Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact. In accordance uh, with our respective mandates, and our mandate specifically, CTAT will continue to promote cooperation between public and private sectors to help member states protect their populations from terrorist threats while protecting and promoting human rights. Technology is neither good or bad, and it's no uh, neutral. These are not my words. These are the words uh, of a famous historian of technology, of technology adding that it's what we do with it that makes the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Michelle, you <laughs> did cut it down, although you're not a robot, but 25% cut, I mean, not a bad start for a human. So thank you, thank you very much. And for those robots who are here, uh, please try also to emulate, uh, emulate Michelle. We will have a very interesting uh, private sector presentation, so that's why I'm mindful of the time so that we all will be in a listening mode and to see all those um, great presentations. Let me, let me turn to Atef, uh, let me turn to Atef Riyazi, Assistant Secretary General of Information and Communications Technology and Chief Information Technology Officer. Please, floor is yours, Atef. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. I too like to join my voice and thank the permanent representative of Netherlands, Georgia, uh, United Arab Emirates for uh, convening us here, as well as Interpol and UNICRI. Um, as I was listening to the distinguished speakers, I was thinking about um, the biggest fear we have as technologists really is um, the future of crime and terrorism. We have seen uh, the uh, the positive impact of technology, it's been incredible, especially when you think the last 20 years, its impact in the private sector, 
its impact on manufacturing, uh, commerce, financial sector, its impact in our lives. Um, but because of the exponential growth, we also see a huge gap because, as someone said, our wisdom, um, I think it was USG Ronakoff about our wisdom doesn't keep up as fast as science does. Um, the gap is a big issue, especially when it comes to security protection and crime, because crime has shifted to the dark web. Crime has shifted to crypto. When we think about human trafficking, drug trafficking, money laundering, a lot of that has shifted. Uh, we think about the wars. The wars are cyber wars, a lot more than in, in the physical world. But our thinking and our mindset is still in the physical world. The way we react and respond to crime and terrorism is mostly funded through the physical world. So how do we make the shift as governments, as entities, as the UN, to think about the risk of today, because I can't even say the risk of the future, the risk of the today, which is a cyber risk, and how do we protect humanity, and how do we protect human rights? So these are the questions we as technologists here at the UN and my colleagues think about, because technology, as it aggravates, it can also mitigate. So how do we embrace technology, artificial intelligence, blockchain? How do we embrace it? And how do we change the way we are structured? Because it used to be that we had this hierarchical structure of governments, cooperation, and people. But the fact is now we have the power has shifted, and we have government, people, and cooperation all on the same level. And how do we structure the way we use technology and the way we use this structure to support human rights and to protect the people. I'd like to talk about a couple of projects we are doing within the UN in support of our substantive side of our operation in terms of building capacity on the cybersecurity, cyber intelligence side. In 2016, we created a new group. We call them the Digital Blue Helmets. We look at this group not as a group within UN that protects the world, but as a group within the world that protects the world. Because it's a paradigm shift in how we think about protection. Their job is to, um, to provide cyber expertise to the rest of the UN, to monitor, uh, to give us a plan around what is cyber peace within the cyber world versus in the physical world. Um, their work has been instrumental um, within the UN and working within different entities as different UN entities change, um, change the way they respond to their mandates. Um, because disarming a cyber virus is very different than disarming arms in a physical world. And how do we respond to that? Peace and security in a cyber world requires a digital way and a cyber way of approaching it than having your typical peacekeepers. So this group is designed to support um, our substantive side of our operation and to help them implement their mandates and create capacity and work with the member states and raise awareness. Because as it was mentioned, most industrial systems of our member states are extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. There was a time that you robbed a train and you walked away with, what, uh, money from 200 people. Uh, the old um, a PlayStation hack robbed 100 million people by one person. That's where the crime is. And when you think about the trafficking in a dark web, Less than 1% of these people are caught. When you think about identity theft, less than 1% are caught. All of our energy, our effort, our investments are made in the physical world. And I just like to ask that we start thinking about um, protection of human life in a, with a different mindset, because the physical mindset of policing does not work in this new world. So we have to integrate technology, innovation, AI with a new model and new mindset. We've been engaging with UN Office of Counterterrorism in adopting a software solution um, which would enable, enable member states to comply with the Security Council Resolution 2396, mandating countries to obtain passenger data. 
from air carriers operating in their territories and analyze the data. I'm very grateful to the government of Netherlands for giving us that software and, and uh, allowing us to deploy it, working with um, Office of Counterterrorism. Uh, there are other programs that we're working on, such as um, financial intelligence software, GoFintel, and whatever we do, we have to do it in a dark web as well as in the light web to track and analyze um, financial intelligence and financial data and movement of funds. Um, artificial intelligence will help us greatly to address some of these issues as it mitigates. So we hope to embrace more and more technology and as it was mentioned, partnership is a big part of this. The private sector, especially the tech sector, um, has a, a big responsibility when it comes to crime and terrorism. Because when we think about the platforms that have been created, that would make it a lot easier uh, to, um, to hack into millions of people within a heartbeat. It is really important that uh, they innovate and they support us and they partner us to be able to respond and mitigate. Um, so with that, i um, like to echo some of the concerns ra raised about the ethical aspects of artificial intelligence. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of dialogue on this. And again, thank you for being here, and thank you for invol involving us to be engaged. Thank you very much. And let me turn to Saskia Bruins, uh, who is the deputy mayor of the wonderful city of The Hague. I have this little soft spot with when it comes to Hague. <laughs> Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I have minus three minutes, I suppose. <laughs> I, I try to, to, to do it quickly. Um, um, the last few days, I, uh, I was in, uh, in Washington uh, on the Brookings Institute Breyer's lecture on international law, and it was called Digital Technology in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, a Comparative Perspective. And I also joined uh, just a small part of uh, the conference of uh, the American Society of International Law, ASL, and it was about international law as, a, as an instrument for development. And in both lectures, and they were both on law and on international law, the topic of data, of in, uh, artificial intelligence, was very present. And about the same questions and same remarks that were raised here, addressed here uh, so far, um, were uh, addressed at that moment. So it is a discussion. It's what is to, to be held everywhere, and everyone is working on this. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to take you just a bit back to the city of The Hague, where I live and where I work, a city like many others, and a city that is not yet immune to crime. And some of these crimes can't always be solved, which means that police stations in The Hague have a pile of cold cases. Last year, the Dutch police were able to revisit dozens of cases using artificial intelligence. Via text mining and machine learning, smart software provided insight on which cases should be reinvestigated. And it's a cautious experiment, but so far, the police, law enforcement, they are enthusiastic. Good news, you might say, and time to scale up, but the experiment also poses questions about privacy, because how long you keep confidential information about victims, suspects, and witnesses, and who may access and use them. And about techniques, because is the outcome of an algorithm always correct? And about ethics, because who takes the final decision in such an inquiry, human or computer? A current legislation in the Netherlands is not yet fully prepared for this, and we don't know when it will be. But it is important to act and to speed up, because artificial intel intelligence and robotics continue to develop also in the hands of criminals. Which is why we need fair legal rules for the use of AI and robotics. Rules that protect individual rights, privacy, and public values. And these rules are the only basis on which we can safeguard data and IA for the greater good. AI, I must say. For the greater good. And you might wonder why the city of The Hague is addressing such issues. And this is because The Hague has embraced the de development of international law for over 100 years. Our peace palace is f a fabulous icon in that respect. 
And in a way, it is the very heart of our city. And we like to use our position as a city of peace and justice to stimulate the further development of the law in this respect. In my country, the national government will present a comprehensive strategy for the use of data and AI later this year. And the European Union is also focusing on this. In the wake of these developments, the Netherlands is more and more becoming hotspot for AI development in Europe. And as a result, more and more parties are being attracted also to our city. Of course, we have been home for Europol for many years, and we are especially proud to host the Unicree Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics in The Hague. And we hope that more UN-related organizations will join the expanding UN presence in our city. And I am happy to announce that the umbrella organization of over 7,000 European AI researchers called CLAIRE will soon be basing its provisional head office also in our city. So, more than 200 institutes, universities, University of Leiden and Delft University, think tanks, NGOs and companies work together from market leaders to startups on this topic. Together we want to make a basis for peaceful, responsible use of data, AI and robotics. In fact, a dream of a, so to speak, digital peace palace that promotes peace, justice and safety also online. And I think we must work together on that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we will be moving to, to the next panel. So I would like to ask everybody who to be seated while we rearrange the table. And I will switch my places with Anita Hertzberg, who will lead the next panel. But before doing that, we will be having the signing uh, ceremony between Unicre and Office of Information uh, Technologies, OICT. So I would like to invite uh, Assistant Secretary to join us at the table so that you can sign the uh, memorandum. And after that, we will resume uh, a very interesting, we will resume the session with very interesting presentation by the private sector. Is that still me? It's not a. It's not a robot. So I would. I would like to ask the panelists to to take the panel, and we will proceed shortly.
dalak debian mere All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we, before we proceed with, with, with the panel, I got a little surprise for you, and I want to turn to my good friend from Unicree to quickly introduce what kind of surprise is that. Irakli, floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so very quickly, actually, we have a demonstration of what technology can do with a very little data, very little resources, and very little time from the Center of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics of Unicree, together with our friends from Emerge, and then CEO of Emerge is here with us. With one minute of data and less than one week and very little resources, we manipulated some video, and, and you will see it, and there is explanation there as well, how uh, that type of technology could be misused in, the, in this purpose. So let me air the video, and then we can, we can proceed with the panel. Yeah, hopefully it is going to work. <laughs> when we tested, it was working. It's both utopian and... Yes, let me start from the beginning, so. For many of us, Artificial intelligence is a complex and highly technical topic. It evokes both utopian and dystopian images from science fiction, and its practical application is often difficult for us to conceive. At our Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics in The Hague, we strive to better understand this topic and learn how it can be harnessed in the areas of justice, crime prevention and control, security and the rule of law. We also grapple with how it might be misused by criminals and terrorists. Our friends at Emerge will now show us one example of how, with a little technical know-how and some time and resources, machine learning can be used to manipulate video footage. The potential for the use of this technology to spread misinformation, undermine political figures and authorities, or even to incite violence or hatred is self-evident. For many of us, Pineapple Pizza is a complex and highly technical topic. It evokes both utopian and dystopian images from science fiction, and its practical application is often difficult for us to conceive. At our Center for Pineapple Pizza Appreciation, the Bronx, we strive to better understand this topic and learn how it can be harnessed in the areas of justice, crime prevention and control, security, and the rule of law. We also grapple with how it might be enjoyed by cats and dogs. Our friends at Emerge will now show us one example of how, with a little technical know-how and some time and resources, machine learning can be used to promote pineapple pizza. The potential for the use of this technology to spread this information and the mind political that's what one minute of data, a tiny budget, and less than a week of time can do. Here's what a little bit more money and time can do. If any of you recall The Sound of Music, you know that in the original, Nicolas Cage was in fact not the starring female role. And here's how quickly these technologies are improving. If I come here next year, I'll be able to have a significantly better simulation for half the cost and potentially with even less data to work with. At Emerge AI Research, our work for enterprises and public sector organizations is to track the capabilities and trends that give companies or countries a competitive advantage. And this isn't only about deception, misinformation, or illegally impersonating someone else. It's about a wider shift in the human experience that we simply aren't prepared for. Namely, for five or six generations, or as long as we can remember, and as long as most of our grandparents can remember, 
Images, audio, and video were artifacts of events that actually happened. This is no longer the case, and that's a big change. And it's a harbinger of a much larger transition. At Emerge, we believe that in three to five years, any reasonably technical college student will be able to use open source algorithms and limited video footage to programmatically create whatever they want, from short video clips to pornography, using images of celebrities or people that they know. And just as with cybersecurity, aggressors will race to create better fakes, and security professionals will race to detect fakes more effectively, a conflict that will speed up the improvements of all kinds of programmatically generated content, from audio to video to text and beyond. So what does this mean in terms of security and the rule of law? This world of programmatically generated everything means that there will need new security and communications protocols in order to maintain a grip on truth, and that is indeed a real problem. More transformative is the fact that this new virtual content will be more than political deception, it will be part of our lives. It will likely become a preferred means of learning new skills, of entertainment, and many kinds of creative workers will come to absolutely rely on these new AI capabilities from designers to developers and beyond. This leads to a more and more virtually immersive world that we spend more and more time in, and that ultimately separates farther and farther from reality and into personal universes of our own preferences. The arbiters of these spaces will hold increasingly more power. It's possible to conceive that this virtual environment would be misused by public or private actors to lull or distract population in order to gain, seize, or maintain power. In the near term, the international community must aim to prevent thieves and criminals from taking advantage of these technologies and learn how to more effectively detect fakes. This is obvious. In the long term, however, the international community should seek to ensure that these future virtual worlds are not misused to wield an overwhelming advantage in the real one. knows how to be simultaneously at the same time in three different rooms when we have <laughs> committees going. And we'll, we'll provide that counsel free of charge, of course. <laughs> Let me turn to Anita Heisenberg at this stage, who is representing Interpol, and she is the director of Innovation Center of Interpol. She will lead our next panel. Floor Thank is yours, you so Anita, much, and please Ambassador. Take. Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, the future is today. And that's also what I thought 36 years ago when I started patrolling as a young police officer the streets of the Netherlands. You know, I had no phone at that time, had a radio room that big, and if there was something emer emergent, you had to drive with the police car to the station to phone the radio room. Do you remember it, John? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was how the future was then. And now I'm one and a half year appointed as the Interpol Director for Innovation in beautiful Singapore. And we have to lead law enforcement to a new generation. A new generation which is totally influenced by technology. How do we want to do that? In the booklet which has been presented today, and Irakli, I'm very, very proud about the work we have done together. On page 22, you see in the police innovation and technology radar. And this is one, it's a living document. We just designed in order to tell law enforcement organizations that it's not only about artificial intelligence. There are many new technologies law enforcement has to realize that we have to look at. It will influence our work tremendously. I'm happy you mentioned darknet and cryptocurrencies, but also drones. What's the meaning of G5? Smart city developer. I mean, are we prepared? I don't think so. Today we focus on artificial intelligence. And um, <laughs> we do that in a very international area. And the, pr the previous speakers all underlined how important cooperation is, international cooperation. I am so curious, as your facilitator, who is in this room? So please raise your hand if you are from law enforcement. 
please raise your hand if you are from government or an international organization. And what about the business world? Where are you? And the academics. Let us not forget them. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> Here we are, a very diverse group, but a very, with a very exciting panel. And it's my honor to introduce to you Deputy Commissioner for Intelligence and Counterterrorism, Mr. John Miller from the New York Police Department. Everyone knows you, of course, from your interview with Osama bin Laden, but that's a while ago, I remember, John. That's a while back. Yeah. Someone special to my right-hand side, because I think we need to honor Trivia Anstad, Assistant Chief of Police from the National Criminal Investigation Service from the Norwegian Police. That's where you are now, Trivia. But a year ago, you worked with us in the Innovation Center in Singapore. And it was you and Irakli taking this initiative to organize this meeting. And it's very special and dear to me that you are here in a different role but present to the work you once started. Very welcome. International peacekeeping, something which is crucial, especially in this house. So a special welcome to Mrs. Estella Argundin Pompo. You are uh, working for the United uh, Nations Police, and I, you are in charge of serious and organized crime team, and originally in a beautiful Spanish uniform. Welcome. <laughs> Mr. Michael Street, happily, I was suddenly seeing you there being one of the only <laughs> academics. I think he's in the wrong spot, but you happily moved. NATO Communication and Information Agency, we have to say Dr. Michael Street. Great to have you and to have this few people from the academic world there. As well as the business, Mr. Brian McDonald, you are representing Pretpol, a company based in the Silicon Valley area in Northern California. Don't you think what a fantastic panel? Thanks so much for joining us today. My ambition is, and, and some of the speakers said already, let's make it a little bit more action oriented. Let's talk about what law enforcement is doing in the area of artificial intelligence and robotics. And um, let me go back just for, for a few seconds to July last year, when we organized that meeting. And I came home with four main conclusions. One is that, and I'm critical to my own colleagues, to my own profession, is that I think if law enforcement, and happily my colleague Carl Alexander underlined that strongly, like if we don't step in into this development now of new technologies, of artificial intelligence, we miss the boat. And from that meeting, we realized, and that's actually the second point, that a lot of law enforcement organizations are actually starting to look at it, concept development, some prototyping, but keep it all for themselves. No, I'm not there yet to share. No, it has to be developed much more. And the result is, for us, from an Interpol perspective, looking at the world, looking at 194 member countries, that we see a lot of energy, a lot of money spoiled by not sharing earlier in order to develop together. And that brings me also to something already underlined, that we see differences between countries. And is it not the fact that criminals will find the weakest spot in the chain? Do we not have a common responsibility to make sure that everyone is on the same page of development? And finally, what I took home was ethics, ethics, <coughs> ethics. Ethics by design, as already expressed by the Dutch deputy ambassador. So, dear panel, where are we? How are we going to look at artificial intelligence in law enforcement? So let me start with a question. Um, if you agree, I call you all by your first names. Sure. Is that okay? Is that okay <laughs> for the audience? Um, John, what are current existing police practices using artificial intelligence? What, what do you see at the moment, both in New York as well as in the world? So 
Right now, the most powerful weapon that every uh, man and woman in the NYPD has is this right here, the smartphone. Um, in that smartphone, they have access to all records of criminal background, uh, probation, parole, every phone number that ever called 911 for help and who that comes back to. It's about a domain awareness system that integrates geographical data with um, structured data with um, government records so that it correlates and disambiguates and so that the power of this device in the hands of a police officer can be translated to if there's a shooting on a corner in the Bronx, uh, they can respond there and look at um, how many gun arrests there have been on that street in the last month, who within uh, 1,500 feet is on probation and parole. Um, what license plate readers in the area might have picked up the getaway car um, by make and model, um, who that car is registered to, uh, that person's social media, facial recognitions that could tie to potential accomplices. So uh, the power of the device and the power of the data um, is left only to the number of layers of questions um, that the investigator or responding officer may ask. Or it could down, come down to something as terribly simple as you and I in a patrol car get a call of a family fight, yep. the world's most generic police call. But before it comes over the radio, as the call taker's typing it in, it's already coming over the screen in our sector. We may want to touch the callback number with our finger and say, uh, Anita and I are on the way to this call. Are you the neighbor? Is the fight still going on? Do you know the people next door? Is there a weapon in the house? Uh, is the door unlocked or do you have to buzz us in? Things that, um, that just are now second nature that didn't exist when you had your big giant police radio, which was sometimes good for communicating, or if it didn't work, you could always hit somebody over the head with it. How is that in Norway? Thank you very much, Anita. Um, the current situation in Norway is that we are still in a very early stage of exploring AI. Uh, what we have done, thanks to, to my time in, in Interpol Singapore, is to create an innovation network to explore these kind of possibilities. And, and from my side, I think it's important that we have the IT services on board because uh, we need to build a bridge between the practical police work and IT services delivering these kind of systems to us. So, so what we have done now is create, uh, creating an innovation network uh, to, to bridge the dialogue between the, the real police work and IT services. So they are aware what we want and, and they can tell us what they can deliver to us. So, so that's where we are now. Uh, we have some some proof of concepts within Oslo police districts. And, and the idea is that if we can use advanced technology to do administrative work, so the police officer can do more real police work. That, that's the first step we want to take. And we want to use less uh, advanced technology first and, and do it in a very controlled and, and, uh, and ethical way. So, so that's the first steps we're taking in Norway. policing what's happening there and well, um, we're fight we're facing a lot of challenges I mean we're not deployed in normal environment we're mostly deployed in uh, fragile states and uh, on post-conflict countries so we rely on our colleagues from ICTV and the, the digital blue helmets and there's uh, some new technologies that we're implementing in several missions like the drone technology uh, the situational awareness program that is currently um, on the, the platform is currently on piloting in, in MINUSCA in, uh, in Central Africa Republic. And then probably we will follow to other missions and uh, through data mining, uh, geospatial information, it helps us to, to at least know where the, everything is happening to get the information of the resources that we have there and, and to be able to respond, to allocate and reallocate uh, the forces. So, but it's, it's a completely different. We are um, a, a very diverse police uh, service. We, we have uh, 90 different countries that are the UN police. And uh, we're, we're also basically deployed in, in peace operations here in mission. So it's, we do the same tasks as other law enforcement agencies, but we also uh, try to sustain peace and prevent conflict. So it's kind of uh, different. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, you work for NATO. So 
it's difficult to ask you the question, what do you see in law enforcement? But could you share with us what you at least see as development? Uh, definitely. And, and we're definitely in the, the peace and security uh, yeah. realm. And from our centre, also based in The Hague, uh, our role is to make sure that, that the end users, whether they're soldiers or, or uh, other decision makers across NATO or, or within our member states, to make sure that when they get access to these kind of technologies, A, the results are presented to them in ways that make sense, that they ways that fit in with their normal mode of operation, normal mode of decision making, rather than being presented with some you know, very complex display of really complicated technology. Um, and the other part, and I think a real fundamental thing for certainly in our, uh, in our team, is to make sure that when people are using these technology, they've got confidence that the decisions that AI or the recommendations that, that AI is giving to them is actually founded on, on some, uh, some fact that it is giving them good advice, it is making good assessments, good recommendations. Uh, we've seen many, many uh, stories in the news about AI systems which start to behave in a way which people expect, but they turn out to have bias which is you know, unacceptable or, or uh, 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 not understood. And uh, our role from our team is actually to be able to, to have people who can go into the technology that we're using to understand how those recommendations are being made to make sure that the end users can use that technology with confidence that the underlying uh, mechanism is, uh, is trustworthy and, uh, and sound. Yes. What is happening? Yeah. You can probably provide us a little bit broader overview. Yeah, we work with about one out of every 33 patrol officers in the U.S., so uh, dozens of, of police agencies from California uh, to New York. Um, and what, we, what we're focused on is physical crime, uh, street crime, not cyber crime, but we're all about preventing crimes before they occur. And it's not pre-crime like a minority report. What we do is we process large data sets. Yeah, <laughs> stuff to use a screen. Um, in fact, this is a screen showing the highest probability of um, auto thefts and burglaries in my hometown of Santa Cruz for tonight. So uh, we process large data sets uh, using machine learning to predict where and when specific crime types are most likely to occur. Uh, we present those on a map, and then officers proactively patrol those areas in order to actually interdict those crimes uh, by their presence before they occur. So we're really all about crime prevention, not crime solution. Um, you know, get out ahead of the criminal. And do you see that artificial intelligence is, uh, is introduced more, is used more? We actually try not to even talk about artificial intelligence when we talk to the patrol officers because they don't want to hear anything about that. They've got a job yeah. to do. They don't want to learn a new computer system. Uh, that's why we actually simplified the interface so much. We give them a map with red boxes on it, and we tell them, in between calls for service, spend time in these red bo your time in these red boxes. So you know, they're all about doing their job as police officers. Um, the technology behind the data we present to them is, is almost not even really relevant to them. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening for a long time now. Maybe there are already questions in the audience you would like to ask the panelists. Please go ahead. Could you please introduce yourself before asking your question? Uh, th thank you so much for a fascinating uh, series of presentations and very practical. Um, I have a question for Pred Predpol, which I suspect other people are maybe may be wondering. So how do you, a as, a, as a statistician myself, I know that if I took crime statistics and I aggregate them and I use them pr to predict, I'm going to find you know, huge biases in, in the data sets. How, how do you adjust for that and what sort of testing did you do to ensure that that was all set up right? And how are you maintaining that? Thank you for that. That's a question that we get asked uh, fairly frequently, as you might guess. So uh, we're very conscious of the uh, potential, um, whether real or uh, presented you know, through the media, of there being bias in the way police operate. Um, what we try to do is use the most objective data possible. So we use uh, verified crime data. We only use three data points. We use crime type crime location, crime date and time. And these are all victimization reports from the victims themselves rather than arrest data. So nothing in there has anything to do with uh, officer-initiated activities. It's all, if your car is stolen, you're going to call the police and say, I was at this address, my car was stolen between this time and this time. Uh, that goes into our data set. You get tens of thousands of auto theft 
records, and you can actually start to build patterns over time of where auto thefts are most likely to happen uh, next, tonight, tomorrow, the next day. And so by using just what, where, when data, no personally identifiable information, no demographic information, nothing about underlying ec economics of the, the, the area that we're patrolling, um, that's our attempt to you know, take as much bias as we can out of the data uh, that we use for our patrols. Tom. Sure. Um, Tom Campbell from Future Grasp. Question for just the panel in general. I'm just curious, what technology solutions might accelerate the adoption of AI in police work? What are your barriers right now? John, can I give you that question? Uh, I mean, our big step in in harnessing AI was um, the technology the technology solution of all of the data that we collected lived in different places. It was all accessible. Uh, we even got it to the point where somebody at headquarters could um, bring it up on a user interface and it would come back to them. Um, Commissioner Bratton, um, very early in his term, said, well, how do the cops access this? And we said, the cops, well, the cops are out in police cars answering a police radio. They don't have access to this. So the big deal for us was turning it around. It was facing inward. And it was finding a simple device that every 14-year-old kid has um, that they can communicate across a number of platforms um, to push that data outward to the officers. Um, that, was, that was the big step in integration for us. Shreva, hmm. what do you see in Norway? Uh, there's no doubt that IA and robotics will be important in the future. And, uh, and as I said, we have started to explore these opportunities and risks. And what we've done, uh, and uh, I think it's stated here, that, that bias is, is, is a bit complicated because we have different databases, different quality of the data, and, and uh, some of the data has been stored for a long time. So, so we are a bit concerned about extracting information from databases. Uh, so, so what we're doing now is, is trying to, to, to modernize the data uh, today and to make it more, uh, say, advanced technology friendly. So, so, so it's more quality of the data. That's, that's one of the things we have discussed. Carl? I think... Uh Every speaker uh, earlier today spoke about accountability uh, in one way or another during their remarks. I would be particularly interested from you, John, and you, Brian, um, about what sorts of accountability systems that you have in place that makes the systems that you have in place auditable so that when things does go wrong, that you can go back and see who had access and for how long and that sort of thing. So that's the easy question. Um, <laughs> uh, audit systems um, and tracing users' activities, um, things like that, uh, just things that you buy and track. Uh, security is key because while you're auditing how your people used it, you have to make sure that some outside entity hasn't hacked in and had their way with this trove of data. Um, because it's broken up in so many ways, it can't be, it can't be bottled up and taken out. Um, but uh, but you want to make sure that it's being used by the right people. So, audit uh, is just a function uh, that is a constant. We are constantly scanning across the system um, at random, and then if we have a complaint or a lead uh, targeted, to see who's accessing it. Are they looking up their ex-wife or their ex-boyfriend? Um, you know, uh, are they doing it for proper police purposes? And, um, and that's an enforcement piece. The more, the, the more important element at the root of that question, though, is you can't figure this out later. Everything we've talked about today, whether it's drones uh, or AI or giving access to such powerful data to 36,000 police officers, um, policy must precede practice. We have a bad habit in law enforcement, particularly, and I say this for all my intelligence commander colleagues, in the intelligence realm of deciding we'll get the technology and we'll start to use it. We'll start the practice, we'll get the data, we'll start to hold it. And then at some point down the road, we get in trouble. And then either people set rules for us or they take the whole thing away. One of the things we got right here 
was before we ever launched the system, let alone turned it around to the cops, is we did a privacy policy. We put the privacy policy up uh, for inspection by the public. We notified the public it was there. We took all the public comments, including from the advocates and the ACLU and the privacy people, a pain in the ass. Um, and then, and then you know, we were able to we were able to integrate some of the, the suggestions that we actually found useful um, to protect ourselves um, and to protect the data. Um, but you can't do it the other way around, which is a long-standing bad habit of, if we start using it, nobody will ever find out we have it until they do. Brian, can you add? Yeah, what I would add to that is <clears throat> we have an algorithm that we use to actually, um, you know, as a, the core of our machine learning platform, and we've actually published that in, a, in several uh, peer-reviewed papers. So that actually, the actual algorithm is out there so people can look at it and uh, even play with it if they want. We also publish the kinds of data we use. It's the what, where, when, crime type, crime location, crime date and time. And so by having that out there, we, we hope to at least you'll be open and transparent so people can then uh, you know, run their own experiments with it, as long as they use the, the right data, crime data, not arrest data, um, uh, to, you know, just because we, we believe that, that, you know, transparency is the key to uh, communities actually accepting this as a uh, means of patrol guidance. dream that we as police officers make this world a safer place to live. How can we use artificial intelligence in a way that is really benefiting society? Michael, do you have any suggestions also for the law enforcement officers in the room? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it would be for, for any sort of security yeah, use, well, any use, it's using this technology to, to make to make life easier for, for law enforcement officers, for soldiers, in doing things that distract them from their core function. So things like, in our world, things like translation between uh, conversations between in multinational groups, perhaps uh, also uh, applicable to, uh, to UN police organisations. So things like that that can just help people to, to operate better together by applying technology to, to that. It's something that we're also applying to, uh, to some of our computer systems of uh, using machine learning to learn how to do translation between different systems from, uh, from different nations. Um, I think the thing where we, uh, where we can't and shouldn't look for AI to, to solve is some of those fundamental decision-making processes. We might augment decisions, we might present more information, help the, the officers get information which will be relevant to them, but then there'll still be some level of decision making which is needed. Uh, but if the, the officer's mind is, is decluttered from some of those mundane things, some of the bureaucracy, some of the administration, uh, some of the difficult tasks, um, translation, things like that, um, then it, leaves, it frees them up to do a better job of protecting the public uh, and use the technology to support them and, and augment their, uh, their behavior. Okay. Stella, do you want to add something? I think what it was mentioned about the legislation is key. So this is also something that we faced when we tried to build capacity in a country where we tried to establish like the basics uh, after a conflict. Um, the first thing that we have to look at when we want to use those technologies is, is there legislation, is there a legal framework in the country that we can use to use these special investigative measures or whatever they're asking for? So I think that this is key, and I think the UN can play a good role. Like we, we need more um, international agreements, like the the UN Talk Convention. Uh, you know, on what is in that case it was a, what is organized crime. But we need more things on that. How we're going to use artificial intelligence and, and guide a little bit member states in the way that you know we have to standardize, not to create safe haven in this country. There's not legislation. They even you know the bad guys can use that on <clears throat> their benefit. So. So I think um, that is key. So uh, then uh, the expertise will come. Um, the police, we were quick to learn. And uh, yeah, we will use some technologies. But we need the legal framework. Okay. Observations from the audience. Who can I give the floor, please? Over there. Um. Oh, we're good? Oh, nice. 
No? All right, cool. Wait, is it, is it? So good. All right. Excellent. So um, there seems to be two different dynamics. And I don't know if this is just a takeaway for me to digest or if it's something for, for the folks who are up if, front. But if you could introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, yes. sure. My, my name is Dan Fagella. I run Emerge Artificial Intelligence Research. I also run the Center for uh, Pineapple Pizza Appreciation in the Bronx. Um, <laughs> the, the folks at, at Unicree, I'm going to be going there for dinner. Um, I, I, uh, I've kind of heard, heard two different dynamics at play here. One is uh, what seems to be an attempt for the folks who are in law enforcement to kind of level up data access. The, the first example there uh, was, was kind of a good example of that. Then there's the PredPol example of kind of taking data that can be accessed and then kind of doing the processing for them and making them available. I, I wonder if it's going to be that latter dynamic that makes these functionalities come to life or if law enforcement really feels capable to level up their own data infrastructures to, to build those applications. I wonder if it's kind of going to be an either or or 50-50, or but it's tough to tell from the outside, but figured I'd throw it out there. So I think an important point along that line is, you know, if you take an organization like the International Association of Chiefs of Police and you look across America, uh, there's 850,000 cops in the United States spread across 17,500 different police departments. That's why we keep it cleanly organized and not confusing. Um, but most of them are six-person or 12-person police departments. They're a sheriff and a few deputies or a chief and a, and a couple of officers. Uh, those people are never going to develop the kind of technology, correlation, disambiguation, uh, AI that we're talking about. So in that case, for the giant majority of the policing business, somebody else is going to have to figure it out, build it, sell it, integrate it, and so on. Uh, the NYPD, Chicago, LA, maybe Boston, Philadelphia, places like that are fairly unique in that, you know, we did a big contract with Microsoft and then found a contract um, facilitator that handled that and all the subs. And that's the only way we got through building this. Um, or we wouldn't have been able to do it. Or we would have been able to do it. It would have take, taken way longer, cost way more, and never come out the way we wanted it. So I think the larger part is going to need help. Michael? Could I pick up on that? Uh, because you raised a really good point there, that uh, law enforcement is traditionally organized around physical, around the physical world, physical location of things, of offices. Do you see a, a need, and I think probably a question to all the law enforcement representatives here, do you see a need for actually some, uh, some centralization of uh, some of the technology which, uh, which Dan was, was talking about? Because there's an economy of scale here, which you know, it's never going to be accessible to those tiny... Uh, tiny units. Uh, on the other hand, it can be distributed very, very readily you know, with this technology made available wherever and whenever, whenever it's needed. Well, I first of all think, you know, the federal government got off to a good start on that years ago with things like NCIC or the National Crime Information Center where you could run somebody for anything from a license plate check to warrants, um, you know, on a national basis. Uh, and the FBI still runs things through their Sieges Bureau. Uh, but on, on the other part of that, um, there's going to have to be statewide databases. There's too many jurisdictions, too many borders, too much crossover that the criminals, and I'm not even talking about the cyber actors <laughs> whose borders are so borderless as to, right. as to almost obfuscate the whole subject, but just talking about traditional criminals crossing borders, uh, that information is going to have to get integrated across many more jurisdictions. You know, is it not the fact that there is so much big data that we have it all, but we are not able to get it out? And that will, in the end, be one of our biggest problems in law enforcement, because the politicians will say, you had the data in your systems. Why were you not able to prevent that ter terrorist attack? And that's a worry of many police chiefs in the world. We have it, it's there, how to access it. So, any responses from the audience? Um, I'd like to add something, because um, uh, as I said, we worked in countries under you know, difficult circumstances and we're basically doing the basics in some cases. And I think one of the basics of connecting law enforcement and getting people having and sharing information is, uh, is Interpol. 
So the first thing that we do when uh, we are advising a police force in a particular country is to check how is the National Country Bureau is like working, is the NCB working, is the I-24-7 working? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, and this is one of the basics, and, and I think the model of Interpol on sharing information and allow you to share with the countries that you want to share because they have, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not the super expert. <laughs> I have, you are the experts on Interpol, but I think it's, it's the way to, to really share. Um, Europol also, they do a lot of analysis. They, they really do prediction and predictive analysis. And they manage to get information from not only European police services, but some others that are um, on agreement with them. So I, I think we have some examples that that can work. And it worked good. Maybe we need just to push it and get it more technological. Yeah. And get it more connected. Over there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Hobbs. Jeff Hobbs, um, future panelist. Um, I, love, I have to consult with some of the former US diplomats. One question I have, uh, one of the takeaways from the Unique Re Interpol report was that, I mean, thankfully, we've seen very few cases to date of criminals and terrorists actually using AI or AI amplified technologies to commit crimes or commit terrorist acts to, to devastating effect. Why is that? Have we been lucky? Has law enforcement been one step ahead? Um, and especially now that we've seen Daniel Fagella's movie um, about how, how frightening and dystopian it, it may be in a few years, do you think, are we only a few years away from seeing a criminal or terrorist act that's truly disruptive? Thanks. I would say, um, you could say we've been lucky, um, but I, I know it's coming. When we do our tabletop exercises where we do multiple layered terrorist attacks against New York City, one of the things that we have introduced into the regular blowing things up and shooting people um, is uh, taking uh, spoofing, not taking over, because it's so much easier than hacking, is to spoof the NYPD Twitter site by changing one character, blasting it out to people with uh, false information, <coughs> doing things like the video that our friend put together of the Pineapple Pizza Crew, um, where uh, you then take a message from the mayor and insert other words, um, either calling for mass evacuation or not calling for mass evacuation or telling people, you know, it's time to surrender New York. Um, these things would have never found their way into a tabletop, which would have been very conventional. Uh, but we understand it's coming. And we want people to be thinking about how do you... How do you draw those messages back? How do you communicate over them? How do people tell what's real and what's not? I get a signal that we have to stop, but I also get messages, you should not forget this, and you should not forget this. So if you allow me one more question, Ambassador. Yeah? What did you say, right, John? Don't forget ro uh, robotics and drones. Well, it was, it was in the title. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I think all these things go together, which is, you know, when you're downloading video, when you're doing facial recognition, when drones are flying and taking pictures. You know, we've seen on, on and I know you've seen it um, in theater, uh, as has NATO, uh, terrorists have harnessed the use of drones for reconnaissance, which is they're going into restricted areas that they can never access with people or vehicles and gathering enormous amounts of video intelligence uh, from high altitudes, medium altitudes. They're using that to plot and plan terrorist attacks. Uh, we know that uh, drones have been weaponized um, and uh, they've been able to mechanically drop ordnance and blow things up, shoot guns. My recent trip to the internet uh, with a drone query found the flying drone carrying the operating chainsaw, yeah. which then just... If you run a crowd of a million and a half people in Times Square on New Year's Eve um, every year, these are the things that your nightmares are made of. Yeah. Um, and then there's the public use of drones and trying to figure out what's an evil drone from what's a benign one um, and how to control airspace and where that data is going and the fact that 85% of the drones on the market are manufactured in China. Um, some, of, some of our examinations of them show that information that's stored in there can be accessed by people back uh, where they're made, which then makes us question, well, what are we using our drones for? What information is in there? Is that a factor? Um, an hour and a half ago at the crowded funeral for a prominent rabbi in Brooklyn, we had a police officer run over by the hearse, um, and it broke his leg. And as he went down, 
somebody in the crowd who was operating a drone wanted to get pictures of that, and that drone flew in and then hit another police officer in the side of the face. So um, Paula Walker, she's now going to the hospital um, with the guy with the broken leg. So I guess I would wrap up by saying, um, in theme with your, your panel, uh, the future is here, and we don't have to get hit in the side of the head to know that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in an applause for a fantastic panel. Wonderful panel. While we rearrange uh, the panel, um, actually, uh, it's good that we didn't bring the drone. We were we had that intention, but you couldn't. F we were not intending to fly the drone, though. But we wanted to show the audience a drone which was neither bad nor benign but could have been turned to uh, both ways. But now that, I, that we know uh, NYPD, and by the way, I do watch Blue Blood whenever I get um, time. Next time we organize this, we'll, we'll approach you to have a better Thank you. Apparently the only droning on this panel was mine. <laughs> <laughs> and let me introduce the next, uh, next panel. Um, we will have... Uh, we will have Charina Cho from Google, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, Keith Stryer from Ernst & Young, uh, Jeff Odlum from Odlum Global uh, Strategies, and Rasa Osterkaitev from OSCE in Jasprit Oberoi from One Qubit, while they are taking uh, place. And the next session will be moderated by Irakli Beridze, uh, head of the Center for Artificial Intelligence. And this is the time for all of us who are the end users uh, to listen to those who really give us the product uh, which is really changing the world and the relations that humans have with each other. So, Irakli, the floor is yours. We have another 50 minutes all together, and after that we will have to close uh, the session. Ambassador Imnadze, thank you so much uh, for introducing. And we are moving to the next panel. I'm extremely excited to moderate this panel. We came really long way uh, together with Ambassador Imnadze when we introduced the AI issue, one of the earlier discussions at the United Nations in 2015. We had some prominent speakers at that time. It was a very new issue. It was, right, it was way before uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations actually uh, start mentioning these issues back in 2017. And, and since then, we developed capacity, we organized a number of events, and now here, here we are with Uniqlo already opening the center in the city of peace, justice, and innovation in The Hague. We are very proud to be hosted there. And uh, right now, many of, the, many of the speakers, many of the prominent speakers, many of the special addresses mentioned private sector being an engine for innovation. We will be focusing how we're going to challenge, face the challenges together, how important is the private-public partnerships. I will briefly also introduce uh, some of, uh, or actually all, all our panel, panelists here, because this panel it represents the real, clear stakeholder cooperation. We have um, Raza Osterkaide from the Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe. We have Keith Strayer from uh, Ernst & Young. We have uh, Karina Cho from Google, and we have uh, Jasper Oberoi from One Qubit uh, Information Technologies, and uh, and Jeff Odlum, former U.S. diplomat and prominent thinker on the issues of technology, um, diplomacy, and innovation as well. Now, uh, let's sort of um, make this uh, session interactive. If you have any questions, please inter interrupt, and we can we can have this friendly discussion. And, and some of the outcomes would, which would be reflected would be very interesting to sort of note how private-public partnership can deliver results and, and without one another we cannot, learn, we cannot uh, progress and we have to be learning. Private sector has been really leading the innovation and, uh, and nation states, countries have started, uh, started to catch up starting from 2017 when countries started to adopt the national strategies. At the moment we have around 33 countries with AI national strategies or with some interests in uh, investments in, in AI, but that's not a, 
very big number because we have around 160 countries which are without AI strategies and, and they are quickly catching up on that. And private sector has been investing in that for a long time, so we have a lot to learn from the private sector and with international organizations. That's where the results could be delivered. Now, uh, I want to give um, uh, one or two minutes to each panelist to mention on the importance of the private uh, the public partnerships and how this is reflected in ethical discussions, how this is reflected in discussions on human rights, and how to balance all of these relationships. So maybe, Karina, you can start uh, first reflecting on these issues. Sure. Hi, everyone. Karina Chow here from Google. AI is something we've been thinking about for a long time, and I would say really in the last four or five years, the entire company has turned around to recognize the power of machine learning and uh, the benefits it can bring our users. Public-private partnerships are essential. Um, there are many different types of questions that we have been grappling with inside the company. I'll give one example. Uh, we were approached by several different organizations to talk about the potential for a neural network model to read lips. Now, like many different applications, you can imagine a potential for enormous good, right? This is the whole reason why people pursue AI in the first place. There's been a lot of discussion uh, earlier today about harnessing the benefits worldwide. Um, we were approached by an um, accessibility uh, groups representing um, patients who are deaf and others who said, uh, if we had a machine learning model that could really help us to read lips, well, that would benefit us in communicating with lots of other people. It would really help us to um, regain our voice in some ways. Um, you could imagine, of course, there are also many different risks with that. If we develop a potential model that can read lips, what does that mean for potential surveillance? Um, could anybody that has video footage without audio footage um, all of a sudden know what you are saying? What happens if that gets into the hands of people who are bad actors? Uh, what happens if um, people at home just want to build their own systems based on a paper or open source model that we put out and maybe spy on their spouse or spy on somebody else they uh, want to follow. So this was one example of uh, the types of things that we are grappling with. In this case, uh, we worked very closely um, on the model to ensure that, um, you know, do we publish this kind of thing? Do we put it out in a paper? Do we open source the model? And we looked and looked at the training data very carefully and worked to make sure that the model only worked for um, a zero degree angle, right? So people who are deaf are speaking directly into a webcam. Um, they must have this um, head on angle, unlike when you have a CCTV camera, for example. So that was one um, restriction guideline that we put into the model. We also ensured that there were specific spatial and time resolution um, specifications for the model to work. So it had to work with these um, very specific features that were um, common only to webcams and not to other kinds of cameras. Um, with those things in mind, we made that paper available, but we did not um, kind of make the larger types of models. Uh, we didn't build them, and we also did not make them uh, available publicly. Um, so these are the types of questions we're grappling with, but you can imagine many others. It's really not just up to Google to um, decide what kind of um, things should be shared or not. These are kind of things that we would really welcome international dialogue. Thank you, Karina, so much. It's uh, really interesting to learn how Google is approaching these issues. Google just set up uh, a panel on ethics, and, and other organizations are also doing that. So I would like to steer that discussion on that. But first, let's collect some ideas initially. So Jasper, maybe you can tell us. Jasper represents one of the most cutting-edge technologies, quantum computing. Uh, one qubit is uh, the largest uh, quantum computing software company and inventing or, or uh, leading innovation. Uh, Jasper is uh, head of machine learning program there, and please, Jasper, tell us your... Thank you so much. Um, so really honored to be here amongst you all. Uh, on the public and private partnership, I think I would like to uh, bring into attention two levels. One, um, there's a lot of development, especially in machine learning and AI, that is happening in our public universities. So um, that is one thing that has recently caught up. And if you look at the news items, you would see Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, everybody basically working with, a, if not more, at least a couple of leading principal investigators and their whole research labs. So this is, this is something that's happening in the public sector. So when we talk about uh, engagements, I think public organizations can actually engage public universities as well. 
Um, but on the, on the private side, uh, the very important aspect of machine learning is data. And um, a lot of data is being collected by private players, and that's what their apps work on. And if you look at your phone right now, you would realize how many applications do you have which are public? Probably none, or from the government, I mean. So all the data that we are collecting, it is with our private enterprises. So there needs to be a partnership between the private enterprises and the public law enforcement or other agencies if we really need to take it together uh, and move forward. Yes, absolutely. And let's uh, move to uh, international organization, OSC. And Raza, please uh, give us your comments on this issue. Good afternoon. My name is Raza Ostroskete, and I represent the OSC. Uh, for those of you who do not know, it's the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which brings together 57 participating states and 11 partners for cooperation. And artificial intelligence systems is extremely unevenly employed um, and, and adopted in, across the OSC area. But I'd like to um, use my one minute, as Rakli proposed, uh, to highlight one issue which has not been raised, and that is a double gender gap. And it's an issue where we both, governments and international organizations, but also the private sector, could do better. So if we look about, um, and probably most of you know, that women are seriously underrepresented in law enforcement structures. In Europe, only one in five police officers is a woman. Globally, the situation is even worse. Women account to about 10% of police officers worldwide. Now, how do these numbers compare to those employed in the artificial intelligence industry? The latest World Economic Forum report reveals that there is a huge gender gap in the artificial in the, in, in intelligence industry. About 25% of women are employed in this industry. But if one looks at the numbers, in addition to being outnumbered three to one, women tend to be employed in areas such as research, training, and information management. They are not in a position of, for example, being software engineers, whereby they would be shaping artificial intelligence. So when you compare these numbers, you one realizes that there is, of course, clearly real life uh, implications. Because it is critical for artificial intelligence developers to be representing the entire population, or else there is a bias. There is a risk of bias entering the code process. So with that, I actually would like to conclude that clearly we need to take some proactive measures to address this double gap, or else the application of artificial intelligence by law enforcement will remain a very male-dominated world, using male-produced and male-applied uh, systems and algorithms um, for, for the society, which is composed of 50-50. I fully agree with you, Raza, and I think this is an important issue and has to be has to be applied. I'm really proud that at this event we have a really well balanced uh, gender representation. Actually, we counted, and I think we have even more uh, female rather than male. And I'm really proud to uh, sort of run it. And, and and the panels also been designed in such a way that Anita and myself were doing it. Also, our Interpol Unicri cooperation is designed that way as well. So we, we're really proud of that. Please, uh, Keith. Thank you. And I think, Iraq, that you had told me recently that you wouldn't sit on a panel if, unless there was equal representation. Yes, I made a formal pledge, and I keep repeating it, that I will never yeah. serve on a panel if it's all only male panels. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, hi, uh, Keith Stryer. I'm the global head of artificial intelligence for the firm Ernst & Young. Uh, and uh, one of the ways I try to sort of look at, look at this space is, uh, and it seems like a shallow way, but really just to consume a lot of headlines, because that's a good place to start. And there's a lot of headlines in this space. And if you just look at the headlines, and I mean all of them, if you spend an hour or two a day like I do reading the headlines, you, you kind of get a sense of where things are going. A few weeks ago, uh, Bill Gates created a headline. You might have seen it. Uh, he was at a conference and speaking, and he, uh, he equated AI with nuclear technology, right? And he he, he described it as both very, AI is both very promising and very dangerous. Uh, he was right. Bill Gates was absolutely correct. I mean, AI is one of those rare dual-use technologies that's uh, also a general-purpose technology that has almost a limitless, limitless number of applications across public and private life. But the metaphor is imperfect, and I think it's important to unpack why. Uh, 
You know, there are over 400 civilian nuclear power plants in the world, but only nine countries have amassed the technical expertise to weaponize it. The situation with AI is quite different, right? You know, unlike, uh, unlike AI, uh, or rather, AI is not a compound, and it does not need special equipment to be developed, handled, stored, or transferred. In fact, all you need is a single keystroke to transfer nuclear-grade AI from one country to another, a single ungloved keystroke, right? And it is because of that special nature, that digital nature of AI, because it is just math, at enormous scale, it requires special attention. I think it is for this reason that this session is so important today, and I I'd also would like to echo the comments of our esteemed colleague, Under Secretary Vronkov, from earlier today, that, that it's important that every country have access to and benefit from AI, especially smaller and emerging countries. And I have a particular privilege in my role to work with and advise governments across the world, including Estonia, Malta, and some others, you know, that, that recognize that in this new digital automated world, it's very important to, to step up very quickly and proactively to maintain relevance uh, in that economy. But I think there's a real uh, imperative for policymakers and particularly law enforcement to partner with the private sector where there is so much investment to make sure that we jointly together achieve that shared vision. Keith, thank you so much. Yes, fully agree with that, that you know, we uh, need to go hand in hand. We need to learn from each other. And at the same time, this technology should be available across, across the globe in every country. And the job what you are doing bringing and helping countries to develop their AI strategies. I mentioned it before, only 33 countries out of uh, 193 UN members and others uh, have it or, or have interest. I mean, this is a critical, really critical, not to create that kind of a gap where one uh, selected group will yeah. become smarter and smarter and will apply this technology and other group will remain behind it and then we will have a very strange world where we'll be living with one selected group dominating on the other. So we need to, yes, and you are really contributing to that and these events are actually also aimed at contributing to to this. Um, Jeff, I think that uh, you uh, still remain to make uh, your thank introductory you, comments. You. And, uh, are, are we on? Thank you, Rackley, for the kind invitation. Um, before I actually say anything substantive, I do want to acknowledge and applaud the, the visionary leadership from Rackley Baridze and Unikri and from Anita Hazenberg at Interpol to, to have the initiative to start this dialogue last year in Singapore to bring together uh, an even larger, more impressive group of multi-sectoral international experts today, and then to be carrying it forward to Interpol World um, uh, later in the year. So I don't see anything else like this happening in the inter international arena. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful to see this happening. I hope that doesn't take away from my time. That Thanks. Um, so I came here speaking. Yeah, <laughs> I'll compliment you all day if you want. No, I, I came here actually with a 10-minute beautiful speech that I was going to deliver. So unfortunately, you're not going to hear my 10-minute beautiful speech where I was going to compare and contrast um, the, the challenge the international community is facing today with regard to AI and robotics for law enforcement with what I think is a similar challenge we were facing two decades ago, one decade, decade ago with nuclear uh, terrorism, combating and c c nuclear terrorism and nuclear smuggling, which I had worked on for many years at the State Department. Later, perhaps if there's time, I can highlight some similarities and some creative ideas to be borrowed from nuclear security cooperation that could apply to AI law enforcement cooperation. But I'm going to put my speech aside and give a few moment, minutes of perspective. I was 28 years a, a diplomat with the US State Department and for the past two years have been a private consultant um, helping emerging technology firms do business with the federal government, with State Department and Defense Department. And I can confirm what most of you uh, already probably assume, which is that the government and industry, especially in the United States, are very different creatures. They have different languages, they have different cultures, they have different operating styles, they have different values. Um, and to to simply state out, you know, a uh, an, an, a, an aspirational assertion that oh, government and industry should cooperate better together is a lot harder in the U.S. context than, frankly, it should be. I mean, if any of you remember seeing the. Um, the testimony that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg gave to Congress, the quality of the questions that Congress people were asking Mark Zuckerberg, I, was, I thought were ridiculous. I mean, I thought they showed such a lack of sophisticated understanding of technology. My, my kids in college could have come up with better questions. So frankly, before we can even get to the point where gov U.S. government, this is specifically U.S., before we get to the point where U.S. government and industry can have uh, a really useful collaborative um, exchange and shared values and, and trust, trust in each other, 
the U.S. government has to get its house in order in terms of understanding the technology better. Now, John Miller made the good point that policy must precede practice, and I agree. The challenge when it comes to these emerging technologies is that policy happens, operates at bureaucratic speed, at human speed, and technology is happening at machine speed, at light speed. And with every passing day, uh, the technology races past the policy um, to the point where I think it's already, it's already beyond the ability of, of the government I used to work for to get ahead of the technology. The most we can do is try to lash up to it and, and, and have it drag us along. Um, but again, b before, before Silicon Valley, and I can't speak for Silicon Valley, but I'd love to hear um, Karina's views. I mean, one challenge is there's a cultural difference between most U.S. technology firms and the U.S. government. You've all seen that some companies, including, including Google, for reasons I understand, are uncomfortable with sharing, cooperating or sharing technology with the national security elements within the U.S. government, by which I mean Department of Defense and Intelligence community. Um, but I think both sides need to uh, uh, maybe find common ground in understanding that national security is not just war fighting. National security is also diplomacy. National security is also law enforcement. And I think the U.S. government, particularly State Department and Department of Justice, FBI, could do, do a much better job of outreach to Silicon Valley, try to find some common ground on, on values and on ethics, um, and try to win over. We, need to do, we, the U.S. government, need to do a better job of, of persuading Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, why it's in their interest, as a, why, they, why they are stakeholders in, uh, in stronger law enforcement within the U.S. So it's, it's, the, the burden is on the U.S. government, as far as I'm concerned, to, to produce confidence and security building measures that will persuade Silicon Valley to start to have that dialogue. And I have ideas about that, but I'll stop there. Right, Karina, do you want to comment on some of these uh, issues which uh, Jeff was raising? Because since we were here, I mean, this is really yeah. right. Yeah, right, really. <laughs> yeah, no, appreciate the comments, Jeff. I think there's definitely a lot of overlap in terms of areas where we already see um, Department of Defense, State Department, and others um, doing work that we absolutely want to collaborate on. So um, we've been working with the DOD, for example, uh, using machine learning tools for search and rescue, um, for a lot of health initiatives, um, for a lot of education initiatives, diplomacy, and others. Uh, this has been a tricky issue, I will say, inside the company, though. Last year, in June, we put out a set of Google AI principles. This was um, designed to create an ethical charter for our own company, right? Even as governments, national strategies, international organizations are developing their own values and ethics, which we've been hearing, you know, repeatedly, ethics, 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 it's very important. We know as a company, Google is already pumping out these technologies. We're already delivering them because we think there's so much opportunity for healthcare, for translation, for access to information and the like. But even as we've been developing them and as we've been waiting for um, you know, international national organizations to develop policies, we've had to come up with some of our own. Um, and so we set these out um, in the Google AI principles released last June. Uh, many people in the room will recognize a lot of um, high-level values, which pretty much everybody agrees with. Nobody disagrees with fairness or privacy or security at a high level. Accountability, these are all good things. Um, the trick is really in implementation and how you balance um, when two or three of the things come into conflict, how you kind of weigh them against each other. Um, together with the principles, we put out a set of responsible AI practices. These are very detailed technical practices on how we are building fairness, how we're building privacy security into our systems. Um, to your point, Jeff, we also um, set out uh, four applications that Google as a company will not pursue, one of them being weapons. And um, that was just something we decided as a company, you know, no value judgments on others. This was just something that our company um, wasn't in our mission, so we said um, we wouldn't pursue that, but we've absolutely released um, quite a lot of uh, technology for others to use, um, and uh, we will be uh, committing later this year to a um, transparency report of sorts, so we'll have um, some insights onto the reviews that have come in over the past year, just so people can see, even as you all are implementing machine learning at your own organizations, as you're thinking about um, your own values, um, you can see how Google's been at least trying to make our decisions against our principles. Excellent. Uh, I think that it is very important that uh, public sector, government learns from the private sector, learns the uh, how these technologies are applied in real sense, how to work with the private sector. 
in, not only in the big countries like United States, in small countries. I was recently in Malta, and uh, Malta set up an AI task force under the leadership of Ersten Young, and and I saw how private sector and government works together, learns from each other, and actually understands to take that issue to to see what are the competitive edges, where to invest in which sectors, and where to take sort of opportunities to to take it further. Uh, I think I'm going to continue with the with the ethical issues and human rights. We talked quite a lot. It is very important. Um, um, companies, organizations, countries are setting up their ethic boards. Google just recently set up one at the United Nations. Secretary General uh, created a panel on digital cooperation, and it was mentioned already several times. Others as well. Let's uh, let's see. What do you think about sort of unifying some of it? Whether time is not ripe or ripe, and at one point probably we would need kind of unification of these standards. And similarly, if we sort of look at it from the narrow perspectives or some of the applications we've been talking about for the law enforcement, at one point it would be great to have real clear guidelines on the use of um, AI for the law enforcement, for the policing. What we are doing together with Anita is actually directed to that, that uh, at one point to have that type of uh, recommendations and guidelines. But, but I want your views that how to sort of bring in all that knowledge to, to apply more on the global scale and how to, we can learn it from together on bigger organizations and smaller countries alike. So who wants to start comment? I mean, it, you don't have well, I, you to. Well, look, Karina kind of nailed on the head when she said it's really about the details, right? It's not just about saying, hey, we're going to be responsible, we're going to be ethical. That's great. But what does that actually mean? And, and I think when you start unpacking that, it gets into very specific things you're going to do or not do, right? And not even we're not going to support weapons. That's actually even an easier one. That's still kind of a principled statement. It gets down to certain kinds of documentation you're going to provide, maybe transparency reports, whether you're going to accept certain kinds of data, how are you going to handle that data, how are you going, certain kind of use cases, because you, you don't really want to ban general purpose technologies, certainly not dual use general purpose. I mean, that could have really broad implications for society. So you really want to focus on the uses, you know, and the human behaviors around those technologies. That's that's really more, you know, our domain, right? And and the technical details really do matter. And you can, ha you can set up as many ethics committees as you want, and that's, in some cases, that's a good idea. I think on the national level or even on the state level, even on a city level, that makes sense. But Look, there's like like John said, there's 15 to 17,000 law enforcement agencies just in the U.S. There's I can't you know there's a countless number of private sector companies. There's not enough AI experts in the world for everyone to have their own AI ethics panel. I mean that's just impractical. So ultimately, it's going to come down to standards. It's going to come down to training. It's going to come down to transparency and these kinds of things. That's the only practical way to see this unfold, you know, at scale. Right. Uh, yeah, um, being a machine learning practitioner, I normally look at things as in looking at the history and finding patterns. So um, if we go very, very back, not even decades, basically centuries when telephone was invented, I think it was 1870 something and around 1890 already our agencies learned the art of tapping on the phone. And within a few years, there were certain guidelines that came up and now from kind of a decade or so, we've had standard procedures as to what is considered ethical wiretapping and what is not. So same as Karina and everybody's echoing that it's all about setting standards. But crossing borders, I think uh, it becomes harder to, to apply those standards. The standards that let's say US government follows and let's say the neighboring Canada follows might not be the same as somebody in the uh, East follows. So good, we have to come up with standards and every organization, every law enforcing agency cannot individually set it up. They don't have experts. Uh, but probably in the end it would come to policymakers and uh, platforms like UN where countries at a high level actually talk about these things and the responsibilities they share and that's how it basically goes. Right. Uh, before others, I mean, I want to ask you, you're a machine learning specialist. You are heading the machine learning in one of the most cutting edge sort of technology companies. Is it, I mean, as, a as, 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 a, as an expert, is it really possible to translate human rights laws, all of them, into a machine readable language? Sort of like, is it, can we achieve that level at one point or we will be always behind? What is your take on that? Yeah. Um, so um, uh, let's, let's, Take an example. We we talk about the the 
I would say the lamest example that a machine learning practitioner uses to explain a process called classification is we want to separate dog pictures from cat pictures. Mm -hmm. Now to do this thing, the complexity of the model that we end up using, it's so, so much that if we end up writing it in mathematical formulations, we won't be able to explain as to why this picture was labeled as a cat. So that, that is an issue which comes up to explainable AI issue. So if tomorrow, um, we, in the NYPD department, we have an algorithm that is now deciding more on the preventive policing side and not on the reaction side, that okay, I really think this uh, community or this person in particular is prone to being part of an act of uh, criminality, then uh, it'll be very hard with the current technology to explain why our algorithm thinks so. So um, as part of it, maybe it's a shameless plug, but I'll make it. Uh, <laughs> quantum computing is something which is a newer hardware than the classical hardware that we currently have to deploy machine learning algorithms. And a wise person back in 1920s said that to solve problems of today, we cannot depend on solutions of yesterday. So probably to solve problems of today and tomorrow, we need to go to a different hardware paradigm, and quantum computing is one. So one of the research groups in my team is currently working on using quantum technology to change the data rather than the algorithm in a way that the data can be simplified so that simpler algorithms can be used to classify and do machine learning, which would basically help us get to the explainable AI faster and quicker. Fantastic. Oh, okay, Karina, please jump so in. One thing I'll add, um, since we're on the topic of explainable AI, I um, definitely agree with a lot of the things you said, Jaspreet. Um, I do think it is not necessarily a fundamental limitation of neural networks per se that they can't be explainable, right? We just nece um, necessarily haven't gotten the technology to where it needs to be. Um, one thing we think about a lot, my husband is an oncologist. He sees a lot of prostate cancer patients. And sometimes when he sees patients, you know, sometimes you've got data and you know exactly what they might have. You know what medications to uh, prescribe. But sometimes he just has a feeling like, I think your tumor has come back. I think you need to go back in for a scan. I think you um, may have this. Let's, um, you know, go see additional specialists. And Typically, he's right. Um, it's this intuition that people have. And if you think about the decisions that all of us in this room make day in and day out, you know, we can't really fully explain every single decision that we're making. Um, and so machine learning or quantum computing or whatever next paradigm actually gives the opportunity to provide more explanations than is currently possible. If you look at some of the latest developments with machine learning and neural nets today, there actually are new tools that people are starting to develop, you know, to look at and say, hmm, I think this is a tumor because of these three or five or seven cells over here. And actually, it's because I saw these 10 examples before that were labeled. So it's not perfect. It's certainly work um, in progress, but um, there definitely are avenues towards that. Right, we expect a lot. So, uh, okay, yes, Jeff, okay. yes. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Let's go ahead. I don't mean to overload this side of the table. Really questions. quick thought. And, you know, I, so I, I, uh, a number of companies that I, that I represent, the last thing they want right now is to have ethics laws or regulations imposed on them legally by either whether it's state or local state or federal government that would not, that's it's not the time for that right now let alone the UN my goodness i mean i love the UN but we're not at a point we're not in a reality yet where the UN can be telling you know private sector um, uh, setting on any kind of obligatory chapter 7 you know um, orders on this. So it has to happen organically. My experience again on the nuclear security realm was to really, we had a breakthrough when we created this uh, organization called the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. Some diplomats in the room might recognize it. Unique you as a you was a part of it, Interval's a part of it. It's a voluntary initiative of like 85, 88 states that come together to practice uh, responding to a nuclear terrorism incident. Um, and so, and you bring together experts, you know, law enforcement, diplomats, nuclear regulators, nuclear industry, forensic data specialists, um, uh, res er, first responders, and they actually sit around a table for days at a time practicing how they would respond to a nuclear uh, terrorism incident. And what comes out of it, and, and so nobody's imposing values or even operational approaches to them. We want to see how all these different countries do it and how the different industries within the countries do it. And then we kind of take best practices from that and share the best practices around the international community until 
there's enough familiarity with them for a majority of countries to say, hey, that was a really best practice that you, Norway, did on that scenario, or you, Georgia, did on that scenario. And so it emerges kind of bottom-up organically. And I wonder if there is some uh, compatibility to that, that approach from the GICNT. Look it up. GICNT from that approach towards what we, you know, that might be one part of a successful solution um, to public-private partnerships on AI and, and law enforcement. I, yes, I fully agree. I think that it is very important to sort of use those examples. For example, in the chemical disarmament, there was a big issue with the chemical industry coming up with the Responsible Care Initiative where they came on board and, and due to those efforts, it was a, a later on possible to conclude the Chemical Weapons Convention and other things. Although very, very big difference, and you agree with this, is that uh, uh, all these weapons of mass destruction, all the chemical, biological, or radical nuclear programs were state-run programs, and on the AI, this is all driven from the private sector. It's very yeah. different dynamic. Yeah. So oh, very different solutions. As you said, we, we have some of these solutions should be sort of today's driven solutions or tomorrow's driven solutions, and but we need to learn some of the lessons. Raza, you wanted to comment on... Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say that just like in oncology, I think in criminal justice sector, this gut feeling, the professional judgment is absolutely key. And we need to make sure that artificial intelligence, especially when it is used by law enforcement agents, does not promote this human um, bias in, in a computerized way. And let me give you a couple of examples. There was a lot of discussion about indirect racial bias in some of the models predicting offending. Race was not one of the variables, but postcode was. And in segregated areas, postcode actually is a proxy variable for race or dep deprived communities. So in a way, that postcode was an, a variable which influenced the outcome prediction. Another example would be, and also similarly, if police, for example, disproportionately target a particular minority group or a, a social group, um, then a, a regular police officer may, uh, on, depending on available data, suggest that an individual member of that minority group or social group would be at increased risk of offending. In reality, that is not the case. He's just more or likely to be arrested. So that we need to keep in mind when we, uh, when we do AI models. Absolutely, fully agree with that as well. I would like to see if anyone from the uh, from the room has some questions. Chris, you wanted to ask? Yes. Uh, introduce yourself. I mean, I know you, but... Uh... Uh, Chris King from the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. Uh, I head up the Science and Tech for International Security Unit. And one of the things we look at is the weaponization of emerging technologies. Um, and particularly through things like the Group of Governmental Experts on Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, which just met in Geneva last week. Um, and I also happen to be the deputy head of the WMD branch, so I do look at the nexus between AI and nuclear a lot, and that, that is a really scary nexus, I have to say. Um, we, we are taking the approach, I think, when we look at artificial intelligence, um, because I take very much on board Keith's comments about general purpose and dual use, is to look at this really as like... You don't look at it as a, as a classic weapon system or even as something like nuclear, which, as you say, is, has very clear choke points. It's much more like electricity or the internal combustion engine. Technologies that totally revolutionise society uh, and were not intended for military purposes but nonetheless made conflict far more lethal. Um, and so that is, that is the approach that we tend to take to it. The problem, as you rightly point out, is that today this technology is, is inherently scalable, um, is being developed by the private sector um, and is, is quite available to anyone who can tap a keystroke. So I take uh, Karina's points on, and this is something you might recall, Karina, we discussed when we were out at Google last August, um, the notion of, you know, where is the responsibility from the private sector and where is the responsibility from the public sector? Is, is there a dividing line there? Our view is, is that it's actually quite blurred um, and that... Really, realistically, you have to start thinking about a spectrum of responses when it comes here. Because, um, as, uh, as uh, Jeffrey said, you know, the technology is moving so quickly, it's, governments cannot keep in front of it, uh, let alone the United Nations, which kind of moves like the Titanic. Um, so the, the problem is that you know, we need to start thinking about um, responsible innovation, um, looking at you know, how do you avoid the unintended consequences of, of technology, self-regulation, things like Google's you know, ethical principles. But then we need to move more broadly into other non-binding political areas as well. And those are things like transparency and confidence-building measures. 
And those have existed for, you know, decades now. And they are applicable in the same sense, in the same way that warfare is applicable. And then possibly moving to, to binding treatments. My, my question to the panel, I guess, is, is those lines are very blurred. Where, where do the private sector and the government, let alone the United Nations, need to, need to start meeting on these fronts? What are the forums that we should be developing um, where we can actually, rather than, and, and I mean, all hats off, obviously, to, to Arakli for, and Unikri for organising this today, but where we can actually have an effect on policy um, and on intergovernmental processes in particular? Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, thank, thanks, yeah. Keith. I mean, fully, uh, Chris, I uh, fully agree with you about uh, uh, AI being a tool and it could be used for both purposes and having uh, different platforms, having something unified. And, 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 and these are intended to contribute to those debates and discussions. And, uh, and let's see uh, to hear the opinions of the panelists as well, that how we can sort of make yeah. it even more stronger and impactful. Yeah, so Arakli referred earlier to the... 35 or so countries that have sort of national AI plans to some degree at this point, right? If you go back just 30 months ago, there wasn't a country on earth that had a national AI plan. So this, is, this has happened very fast. And really in 2016, 2017, it was only really a handful of, com of countries. It all sort of really cascaded last year and, and continues to cascade. E and even those countries that have rolled out plans as early as Canada, who I think might have been the first uh, on up to the other countries, you know, those plans are still sort of rolling out. I mean, they're not, no one's done, you know, so you sort of have your first plan, then you, then you go from the national plan to the agency levels, and then they push it down. So everyone's in a different state. But I think it's a very important time to address that particular question because if you look across all of the plans, and I've played a personal role in a number of them, uh, the, the, there is a com there's some common threads, right? I mean, the number one objective in every one of those plans is the same, which is national competitiveness. It's the number one objective. Number two and three differ. Okay. If you look at the plans and start to break them out, you'll see that countries are, are focusing on different priorities underneath number one. So India, for example, wants to be the, the garage of, of AI innovation for its region, you know, and to share public health innovations, for example. You know, and so you just you see these different sort of themes. But number one is always national competitiveness. And the reason why I mention that is because, you know, that dance that we're having right now in that sort of public private sector uh, forum is just that challenge of how, and I think, I think you said it, Jeff, you know, don't overregulate me because I need business, right? And, and, and the smaller countries in particular see AI as an opportunity to really punch above their weight, right? So, so for example, when Germany announced their plan back in the fall, you know, very predictably and understandably, they said right in the plan, we will be loosening regulations around autonomous vehicles, and they have to to compete with Japan and China and other countries where that's, you know, a major sector of their economy. You're probably not going to see that in the Estonian national plan. You know, it's not as important to their plan. Other things are important to their country. So different countries are going to prioritize different things, but I think it, it, it does hinge a lot on economic growth, and I think most prime ministers, presidents, you know, heads of state have come to the conclusion fairly quickly that the future economic strength of their country in part hinges on whether they find a place in that global AI ecosystem and they're going to be hesitant to overregulate too early. So I think that's just the dance that we're in. Could I ask Keith a, a quick follow-up oh, question? Yeah. Because yeah. since Keith has great expertise in the national strategies and national plans of a number of countries, how many of those national plans or strategies actually have specific language kind of laying out, charting out how the government is going to deal with the industry in that country, like creating stakeholder dialogues? Or it's actually pretty consistent. I mean, that, again, along with that number one, almost all of the plans, as I can tell, uh, have private sector AI adoption as a core, a core work stream uh, across the board, which I think is a little unusual. You know, I mean, it's, again, it's pretty consistent. Right. At the same time, I mean, I still want to underline that how important it is that this will not be remained as a 33 countries. It should no, be no, no, no. 193 UN member states and That's everybody right. else involved in exchanging information, technology that, you know, uh, we will have benefit across the board. Now, um, I will take in one more question from the floor, or maybe two more questions from the floor, or maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yes, we need to be mindful of time as well, and I want to ask well, one last question. In seven minutes, you can take ten questions. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's, do, let's do it really quickly. Uh, right, please introduce yourself as well. Thank you. My name is Amadeus Shabinsky. I represent the World Information Transfer in Consultative Status with ECOSAC. I just have one question in reference to all this privacy and government. What are the avenues or instruments that IA will not impose on a person's sexuality via facial recognition? That's it. Thank you. Right. Anybody wants to sort of uh, take that question? 
I mean, there are different applications of uh, AI. There could be it could be misused on, on in different ways, I suppose, and uh, and uh, many type of applications can come up. I mean, I don't know if I can sort of uh, comment directly on uh, specifics of the question. I mean, if you want to repeat. Uh, instruments that AI will not impose, meaning artificial intelligence, the group, will not impose on a person's sexuality via facial recognition. If that question even has come up, and that's right. the thing. You puzzled, you puzzled the panel. I mean, we have the global experts, we have the well, there biggest was, minds there, in the there, world there, here, there, and, yeah. and everybody's looking at each other thinking, what shall I answer here? Well, I mean, is that an answer? Well, there was, a stu- there was a study done last year. There was a stu- Oops, sorry. There was a study done last year. It was published, widely published. I don't remember who ran yeah. it, that where researchers showed that using just an image using facial recognition, and I don't know whose algorithm they used or whatnot, but they were able, they felt to identify someone's sexuality simply on the basis of an image. Uh, and, and obviously the implications of that study were, were you know, raised a lot of questions. Yeah, right? and it's a very dangerous practice, yeah. of course, especially in the countries where uh, this might be sort of uh, yeah, punished yeah. in a yeah. different way. And, so and obviously you, you, we need to be really mindful of these situations and... Uh, yeah, and, and sort of discuss that more thoroughly. And perhaps, uh, Anita, we can sort of take up some of these questions in uh, Interpol World uh, next uh, July and, and address that as well, uh, oh, Karina. Just one other small thing I'd add. I think it's definitely a um, loaded and tough question. Um, we did some work with the Gina Davis Institute using facial recognition to identify whether speakers were men or women in millions of hours of TV and movie footage. And this machine learning algorithm was actually used to help quantify um, that women had significantly less screen time than men. Right? This is something you wouldn't be able to do um, just by hand. Nobody's going to watch a million hours of movies um, and mark men and women on screen. But we showed, um, quantified um, that women had less screen time than men, women had less speaking time than men. And in fact, the movies and TV shows that had women at 50% or more speaking and screen time did better at the box office. So that's just one way of turning some of the technology on its head, too, to think about, of course, there are ways to discriminate. There's also opportunities to make the world a bit better. Fantastic. Maybe we'll take uh, Maria. You wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I, is, is it working? Yeah. So I'm Maria. I work for um, End Violence Global Partnership. And no, we are not a bunch of hippies. We work um, on solving some of the biggest problems in the world, including investing in uh, online <laughs> solutions for online safety and digital safety of children. Um, I just want to make a point that um, along the lines of, of being a woman, um, I am, as a woman, 20% more likely to die in a car accident. And that's because the training data set for industry was a white reference man that was used to build uh, crash, crash dummies were based on, uh, based on a white man. Uh, they were used to build uh, bulletproof vests, so police officers who are female are more likely to die in, a, in open fire because they're not wearing bulletproof vests. So that's a data set that was used by industry for 50 years to build solutions to, to answer solutions and things for humanity. So I'm just wondering how can we make sure that the inclusivity and fairness of data sets that is being used for training AI is actually taking into consideration everybody and is working not only for you know white males, uh, people who speak English, but also people who speak Montenegrin, because I'm from Montenegro, for example. So like, how do you make sure that people and, 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 and situations to which AI and tools that they're built are actually being um, uh, you know, working for everybody. So what are, what are some of the examples of good initiatives around like uh, building good um, training data sets? I would really want to know about that. Thank you. The extremely important question, having a healthy and proper data sets to train the machines. So maybe Karina and Jaspit, you can also quickly comment it. Let's keep it concise because uh, our master of ceremonies is reminding me that we need to sort of, yeah, and we'll have one more question. and. Okay, great. Um, I'll keep my comments really short. This is a very important problem. Um, There's three ways that we think about this at Google. The first is in the data sets, so really trying to build more diverse data sets. There's a lot that we're doing to gather data from different people, um, not just in the US, for example, or in the Western world, but from people all around the world. Gender equity, of course, as you've said, age equity. Um, There's a lot of different um, ways that we can try to build fair data sets, so that's one thing. Happy to chat more in detail later. Um, The second is um, you're never going to have a perfect 
perfect data set. Like even in um, the you know best situation, the world isn't perfect. The world has a lot of biases in it. So there's actually things that we can do to build constraints into the model itself. Something that we did um, with Google Translate, for example, which trains on millions of examples of web translations. Um, there's a lot of bias in there. It always came out when you translated from Turkish, which has um, you know gender neutral to English. It would always come out, he is a doctor, she is a nurse. And that's just embedded in the biases that exist on the web and in the biases that have existed over history. Something that we worked very hard to do was build constraints into the model so that now if you type something into Google Translate in, in, in Turkish, the answer in English comes out, he is a doctor and she is a doctor. So there are things that we can do even in the model itself. So the data, the model, and then finally um, a lot of testing is needed. Fantastic. Jasper, do you want to uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll just take one line. I think um, when these solutions are deployed and there's business to be done with it, there's, uh, let's talk about private enterprises, there's money to be made. I think that is the driving force of them going ahead and then acquiring more data. If people see biases, if people see wrong things being predicted and classified, they report it. They tell us that your tool isn't doing well. So that, that is basically more penetration of these tools into more and more people that will improve these tools because then companies like us would strive harder to get more data, which is less biased. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one uh, yeah, question, and you can introduce yourself, please, as well. Thank you so much. My name is Jessalyn, and I'm the counterterrorism advisor at the United States Mission to the UN. We have a strong interest in this space, and so I'll be very brief with my question given the time. Um, looking through the lens of peace and security in the Council, what are the panel's thoughts on what you think are um, this is very generic, but to zoom out into the policy space to how member states can discuss this issue, what are your thoughts on what threats to international peace and security are posed by AI and the misuse of it? Thank you. Right, maybe briefly you can comment on Rasa or uh, Keith. Well, you, you, want Jeff? A, you want Jeff, why don't you answer okay. first? Well, it's, I mean, yeah. it's a very long laundry list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> quick answer. Um, I mean, the quick answer would be uh, just a, a selective sampling would be the lethal autonomous weapon systems for which there is currently not yet um, uh, an international understanding of how they can be, of the R&D and use and deployment of them. And there ought to be. And now that I'm free of the U.S. government, you know, yoke, I can say that I'm, I'm unimpressed with the work at the, at the uh, in Geneva um, at the GGE. And I think that that's, it's important enough. So maybe perhaps the U.N. should consider taking it to, you know, a, a higher level decision making body. Um, the deep fakes that we saw from from Dan Figella, you know, the ability uh, to to spoof and manipulate um, and create biases in people, um, and just the speed, the the immediacy of decision making um, in the battlefield space. I mean, again, I'm not I'm I'm a former diplomat, not a not a military strategist, but but I know that uh, colleagues of mine at DoD are particularly worried about. Um, what AI will be able to do in terms of battle space management, you man, you know, command, control, communications, um, and intelligence. So that's just three of, of dozens and dozens of ways in which it's going to affect international peace and security. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, we have like two short comments, Ambassador Paolo Zampoli. <laughs> so thank you, Madam Director, and uh, thank you, my Renes Konix. Um, I think uh, drones have been a little bit uh, neglected uh, on the uh, on the previous things, uh, and we learned uh, about the killer drone. But the most, my concern is drones carrying nerve gas. We can have a storm of drone from uh, across the, the water going to Times Square like in a few minutes, and this uh, has to be addressed. Also, seeing what happened in all the airports during Christmas in London and now also New Jersey, we have to have an electronic drone a dome around the airport, around the stadium, or crowded places. Um, they exist, they've been tested uh, with companies that have been working, but we need the, the approval of FAA because uh, uh, taking down a drone or stopping a drone is unfortunately uh, still uh, not uh, legal. Only Congress passed uh, uh, a law to uh, allow NSA, um, FBI, and the Department of Science to, to take down a drone, which is still considered a plane. So um, considering that if there would be an attack uh, with nerve gas, we have no solution. Nobody has a solution yet. We don't have a response solution. We don't have antidotes. We like to create the same group that you had for uh, 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 atomic uh, attack for, on this concern. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, fully agree. I mean, there are. I mean, drones are uh, big issues. There have been major disruptions through it or, or already, and we are also 
sort of studying this issue, Interpol is doing a lot of interesting work, and you might want to sort of compare some notes with Anita as well on this. On this, and we'll be looking at how combination of AI and drones will become uh, more dangerous in the time to come. From from our perspective, how this could be used for the criminal purposes, how it could be used for the terrorist purposes, and others as well. CEO of Teda, Net, Teda Networks, Tufi Saliba, wanted to comment or ask. Tufi, I'm CEO of uh, Toda Network. A question to uh, Karina uh, or anyone uh, from um, the panel. What's being done today um, to prevent governance of AI to change its mind tomorrow. So for example, you might have some promises tomorrow, today to say, we will not do this or we will not do that. But tomorrow is management in any of those companies may, might change their mind. And there are a lot of autonomous decentralized governance being done in cryptography that is not being utilized by any AI research center today. So I wonder what else is being done in that situation, or are they looking towards decentralized governance for at some point in the future that the public is not aware of? Thank you. Yeah, I'll just give a short answer. I'm happy to discuss further. I, as I mentioned, um, inside Google and I think inside many other companies too, these are decisions that we're almost having to make because of the types of launches and publications um, that we're coming out with. We know we are having to um, have our own self-governance right now. At the same time, we want to make sure we're not making these things alone. We want to make sure that we are accountable. Um, so we've been joining with groups like the Partnership on AI, as well as IEEE, International Standards Organizations, and many others who are bringing together together bodies of experts, right? It's not just Google acting alone, but we're sharing best practices. We're coming to common norms and agreements on you know, what we will do and what we will not do. Um, I think that kind of thing is very valuable. And we've been in a lot of different discussions with governments, policymakers around the world, and I think we would really welcome those continued conversations. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to conclude this panel, but before concluding, I'm going to make two comments and one actually question to all the panelists, which would require maybe one or two uh, word answers actually. So I'm uh, actually looking at the at the room and I don't see a piano. And I tell you why I'm really sad about this because um, because uh, in December we held uh, we held an event in in Shanghai in China. And at the end of the event, Keith Strayer paid, played us a piece to celebrate the human creativity. We want to remain human. I mean, I'm not going to ask panelists to sing here. If we had a piano, certainly Keith would play a wonderful piece, and, and, and he's creating music himself. So, and, and this is the celebration of human creativity. What I wanted to ask is that, I mean, end of the day, we want to remain human. We don't want the systems to take all the decisions for us and basically making, redundant, making us redundant. Therefore, what is that that we should do to remain human? What is it that we should strive to remain on that level that Keith would always compose the music and play for us and others will do their creative bit and we would remain as a human species, as a race which would create beautiful future, longer and happier lives. So maybe each panelist can give us like one or two thoughts on this and then we will conclude the panel with this positive note, I hope. Love and compassion. <laughs> Love and that's, compassion. My, that's my hippie answer for you, right, but it's true. Fantastic <laughs> answer. Jasper? Actually, very same. I, I, I still feel emotions is something that will be very, very hard to get from a machine, no, no matter how intelligent that machine is. So anything related to emotions would still be human. Adding to that, I would say curiosity and kindness. Curiosity and kindness is wonderful. Yeah, I would say originality. Originality. And I would say free things, a human autonomy, justice, and fairness. This is all fantastic, and I say that these beautiful minds working together, this cooperation, this private public partnerships, and this type of initiatives will sort of enable us to remain human. Uh, human. And I will hand my uh, floor to the ambassador, Imnadze. Thank you, uh, Irakli. Thank you for this very nice uh, final uh, note. Uh, he has trespassed all the limits, but as you may have noticed, <laughs> His, his, his last name has the same ending as mine, so he... 
<laughs> he abused of being of my my country's nationality. But on on more serious note, uh, thank you all for uh, participating. Um, before giving floor to concluding uh, remarks to Bettina and Carl, indeed, let me say a few things or just one sentence from me. Uh, it's all about use of how we use the technologies, because starting from the days in memorial where the first tool a human got, which was a stone, it has its dual use. It could have been used as a tool for progress, it could have been used as a tool for menace or for killing or whatever. Today we also have new tools and artificial intelligence, the technologies, again it's a tool and it's all about how we uh, use it. This topic is endless. Uh, we just started another session of a uh, series of uh, discussions, and I do expect that with other partners, we will continue this talk in this premises. There are so many organizations, so many hands of United Nations that are, that are working on it, and I hope that at one day, at one point, all these ships will sail together as, as a fleet and we will have a better humankind uh, of tomorrow than it was uh, yesterday. Let me turn to uh, Bettina first, and after that to Carl for these final remarks. Please. As well as the government from the UAE and the government of, of Netherlands, we really appreciate We've had an, an enormous privilege to, to have such um, wonderful panels, such diversity. Um, the panels, uh, of course, uh, Anita, our special speakers, the USGs that have come, we're really grateful that we have all come together. Because I think the theme, I have a huge list of food for thought that I'm coming out from this meeting, and I think that we all do. And, but the main one for me, it's collaboration and communication. And the role of the United Nations is particularly to, to convene and to bring awareness and to facilitate. So we talked about the needs for standards and guidance and policy. The United Nations doesn't need to establish those rules and regulations. I mean, I used to be the controller, but uh, I, I, I think that we need the spirit of collaboration and working all together that, that will take this theme forward. And certainly the United Nations is a, is a great venue for that to happen in an objective, global, unbiased manner. I think that it was very important that you brought the issue of gender, um, it, 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 privacy, all these issues are important, and that is what is embedded in the UN Charter. So I'm, I'm offering really this home, this house where we are now as, as a venue, as a place where we can come together to discuss these issues um, uh, together, but we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it alone. We need the private sector, we need academia, we need the ethicists and, um, and the public really to, to chip into this conversation. The time is now, it's, uh, we heard about the the need to, to address these issues um, in the context of, of law enforcement from the unique point of view, but I think for, for humankind. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your interest, for having um, come here. This is just another um, point in, in, the, in, in our path. And I hope that you all will exchange business cards and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, virtually uh, and, and keep in touch because I think we need to, to come together to do that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bettina. Let me turn to Carl. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And I joined Bettina in, um, in uh, expressing our gratitude for your leadership in uh, managing uh, this event uh, uh, today. Um, um, I came here. Um, as I stated in my uh, opening remark, I was uh, in a listening mode, uh, and um, I have to say I was not disappointed with uh, many of the things that I've that I've heard. There's a lot of innovation out there. There's uh, uh, a lot to be done, uh, both uh, on the uh, policy side and perhaps the legislative side, but not too quickly, mm -hmm. perhaps, to allow. Um, uh, um, uh, AI to develop um, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, better. But as we leave this room, 
I think uh, during the course of uh, this afternoon, I heard a couple of things that really uh, <laughs> stuck with me that I just want to use these catchwords uh, that I heard that I think we all need to kind of like keep in the back of our minds. Ethics by design, really very important. I mean, you know, we cannot move forward without having a regime, and it was good to hear that many of the companies uh, are represented here, you know, are uh, very conscious of that and are taking steps. And, uh, and we'd want to be able to draw from that and uh, share uh, with others. While I'm on the issue of sharing, um, also learn, as we recognize at Interpol, that many of our 194 countries are, they are in different stages of development. And so some are more advanced, the others uh, less advanced. But we need to share. Share information is what Interpol does. That's our core business. And as a neutral international platform, we will continue to work to share what we learn in this process. The other thing that I heard that was very striking was uh, uh, it's obvious, but uh, the way it was put here was so simple. And uh, policy must proceed practice. Very often, you know, we rush into, you know, uh, endeavors and uh, yet don't lay the foundation uh, to sustain uh, uh, what we are about to do. So uh, again, as, uh, as the conversation continues in Singapore and elsewhere, that this is something that uh, we need to take uh, uh, into account. And finally, uh, <laughs> It's hard to really understand why this continues to be a problem. Uh, gender. Come on, folks. We need to get over it. Uh, so, you know, um, we, I take your, as you were talking about uh, the Raza, um, uh, the, uh, the issue of gender in this area. I think it's something that uh, we don't perhaps pay as much attention as we should, and that's a shame and shame on us. So again, issues to take into account, and um, I look forward for the continued conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, the panelists. I want to thank the previous panelists. Uh, I want to thank NYPD particularly because uh, we, we walk the streets of this city. Uh, we walk the streets of this city and uh, New York is one of the safest uh, cities if you compare to, to the big cities. And uh, every time you see police, you may not feel comfortable, but police is the first thing that you want to see when you are in distress. So uh, thank you guys for, uh, for that. Thank you everybody who who stayed, and also the experts who made sure that this meeting took place. <laughs>